Well, when I, um, I started in politics in 1997, kind of. I was a young uh, student at Rick's College. Yahoo. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, back in the day when it was still Rick's. And I, I just, when I moved out here and went to the Luciferian University in Salt Lake City up on the hill, I decided to major, uh, double major in anthropology and environmental studies. Now, you know how liberal the U is. Yeah. Just imagine what an environmental studies major was like. But it was, it was a blessing. Because what happened is I applied for an internship in Washington, D.C. with the Clinton White House at the Council on Environmental Equality. And because of my major, I got the internship. And my wife and I went out to Washington, D.C. And uh, Al Gore was the vice president. And he had brought with him a couple uh, ladies from his uh, Tennessee office where he was a senator. And they started uh, what we know today really is the modern environmental movement out of the White House in, the, um, in that time. And what was interesting about that is I, w I was a naive young kid, had a couple experiences there that really turned me off to politics and helped me to realize I was not a Democrat. Uh, so I came home and joined the Republican Party, which uh, is uh, another, just, you know, just one, one other evil uh, that's supposedly a little bit better than the Democrats. And if you believe that, you know, uh, God bless your soul. Uh, I, someday we all got to learn better. And because there's, hint, there's only one party that matters in the world, and it ain't run by the Republicans or the Democrats. So um, in, in, when I was in D.C., I was in... A, any, anybody ever toured the White House? Okay, right next to the White House is this beautiful old building called the Old Executive Office Building. And the White House is really small, and you can't run the White House from the White House, so a lot of it's run from the Old Executive Office Building. And I was there one day trying to figure out what my paper was going to be, because I had to write an intern paper coming back to the U, and I decided that I wanted to write my paper on the designation of the Escalante Monument in Utah. How many of you remember that? Okay. Who designated that monument? It was Bill Clinton. And at, it was unprecedented because it was the largest monument ever in the history of the United States. Now, there was also something else unique. Guess what he didn't do with Utah leading up to that? Didn't talk to us at all. And in fact, he uh, hid his uh, conspiracy to take the land by executive fiat from the state of Utah. And because of that, Jim Hansen, who was the congressman at the time, subpoenaed documents through the legislative process. And I got to go through and read all those documents before they ever hit the public. And the press secretary said that I could do that because he said, by the time I published my paper, they would be out through the subpoena of Congressman Hansen. And so I got to go through this box that showed all these personal communications between Bill Clinton and others, uh, purposefully keeping that designation secret. Now, the reason I tell you that story is after thinking all of my life that I should be a constitutional conservative Republican in politics and go out and try to save the world and be like Captain Moroni, uh, I, I lost a lot, I won a, a little bit. I, I realized that I was never going to change the world through politics. And that full realization didn't hit me until 2020. And I, I'll just tell you one more quick little thing, and then I wanna to jump to 2020. Uh, in about 2016, I decided to become a real lawyer. I kind of avoided it my entire adult legal life. And I got a call from Ryan and Ammon Bundy, and we put together a legal team and went and represented Ammon Bundy in Oregon and Nevada. And very few people know the real story of the Bundy case. And anybody ever been to Oregon? 
Portland? How are the politics in Portland, Oregon? Okay, so imagine, imagine defending Ammon Bundy. Does anybody not know who Ammon is? Okay, imagine defending him in Portland, Oregon. How are you feeling about your jury? Not good. The jury in Oregon unanimously voted to acquit him. Unanimously. Wow. That's, it was a liberal jury. And there were people on that jury, there was a, a, a liberal gay feminist on the jury who came up to Ryan Bundy afterwards and said, I loved what you said about your religious beliefs and the Constitution. I don't agree with you at all, but you were amazing. And so even people of an absolutely dichotomous spectrum of political thought voted to acquit them. Now, you haven't heard that story, right? The, the news didn't tell you why a liberal jury would acquit Ammon. We then went to Nevada and defended Ammon in Nevada. And the judge who was appointed to the case was appointed to office by Barack Obama and Harry Reid. How do you feel about your chances with the buddies there? She let people onto the jury who had worked for Harry Reid's office. And Harry Reid had come out and spoken publicly against the Bundys. She flipped 180 degrees and dismissed the case against the Bundys with prejudice for outrageous prosecutorial misconduct. Wow. And again, that story never been told. So I get done with the law, and I get done with politics, and then 2020 hits, right? The Bundy case was in 2018, and by 2019, uh, President Russell M. Nelson is in Rome, dedicating the Rome Italy Temple, saying to all the members of the church, this is a hinge point. point. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty dramatic statement. Um, I'm not used to apostles and prophets of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints saying interesting things these days because they're so subdued, right? And you go to General Conference and somebody said to me, it's called General Conference for a reason. It's not a specific conference. <laughs> it's not exciting conference. It's general. And you're going to get general. So when President Nelson is standing up in front of people saying, hey, this is a hinge point, I'm like, uh, no, that was what Joseph Smith did. That was a hinge point. So what do you mean this is a hinge point? And I couldn't kind of shake that thought because every time I've ever asked the Lord for a witness of the sitting prophet of God, he gives it to me like that. And, and so I already had a testimony that President Nelson was a prophet of God, and here he is standing up in front of everybody saying, hey, this is a hinge point. So... Anybody remember the date of that statement? April 2019. Fast forward one year. <laughs> what happens? What else did he say besides this is a hinge point? Things are going to start accelerating, right? So I thought that was interesting. Now, where did he say that at? Rome, Italy. Where did the world go the most bonkers in 2020? Italy. Rome, Italy. And they shut down that temple within a year of its dedication. You know, they opened it back up. I get that. But after having been a lawyer and a politician for 27 years, uh, I wasn't a lawyer for that long, but I was in politics and law for that long, um, I learned about these things called mod model laws. You heard of a model law? Raise your hand. Okay. If you're not raising your hand, you have. You just might not recognize it as a model law. So have you heard of uh, the Uniform Commercial Code? It's a model law. Anybody heard of a divorce? It's based on model laws. Now, let's say that... Um, who should I pick on? I'll pick on Clayton, because his wife would never do this to him. Uh, let's say that, you know... Actually, let's pick on Clayton because it's not fair to pick on his wife. Okay. Let's say Clayton just goes off the deep end, right? And um... every 
And uh, I, I can't even pick on the two of you for this because it's, yeah, I'm going to pick on myself. Because I can't even insinuate this about other people. Let's say I go off the deep end, cheat on my wife. She decides she wants to get a divorce. She goes to court. What do you think she'd say? She'd say, the grounds for my divorce is? No, you cheated on me. Adultery. You can't do that in Utah. Why? That's crazy. I mean, it's, it's right in the, the Bible. Yeah, it's, it's not against the law. the law, but it's in the Bible. We're, we're all Mormons around here. It's like 65% Mormons. We all believe in the Ten Commandments. You can't get a divorce. It's not grounds... You know what you can use it for here in the state of Utah? My wife would be able to go and say, hey, he committed adultery. So for the purposes of giving me alimony, money, you should consider his adultery for monetary uh, assignment through alimony. That's it. It's, it's a no-fault divorce state, and so is every other state in this nation. Now, how in the world did Utah get basically the same divorce laws as California? It's because you all share the values of California, right? <laughs> so how did that happen? Because we like to pride ourselves on being a little bit different than California, yet generally our divorce laws are the same ones that everybody else in this nation has, and we all have no-fault divorce. Irreconcilable differences. How did that happen? We weren't paying attention. Okay, so who did it? Then, if, if it was, and where did the legislature get these ideas from? The bar. The bar, maybe. But did you know that our legislators belong to organizations like the NCSL, National Council of uh, National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council? Anybody here live in a city? Have a mayor? You know, your mayors belong to two organizations, the League of Cities and Towns and a National Association of Mayors. Do you know who pays the dues for your politicians to belong to a political union? You do. Since when do we allow our politicians to join political unions that we pay for? Wow. Hey, Morgan, the mayor of Orem did not join the League of Cities and Towns. The whole city did not? Yeah, he, he said he would not because he knew what it was. That, you know who the last city was to do that in Utah? Laverkin. <laughs> and they declared a UN free zone. I love Laverkin for that. <laughs> and they got all this flack. I mean, they made like national news. That's amazing. So, so those are, you know, model laws come from these organizations that are outside the state of Utah. Anybody ever heard of the building code? Yeah. Yes. Where does the building code come from? <clears throat> Planning and Zoning Department. They don't make it up. The Utah legislature does. And the Utah legislature is so ignorant of the building code that they don't even put the building code into law. You know what they do? They generally reference a set of international codes that they adopt into Utah's state without even reading them. <clears throat> Pass them right down to your cities and counties and make your cities and counties adopt an international building code that none of us have anything to do with. Now, try to go get access to that building code, and guess what? <laughs> Hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to even get into that code. You can't even go read it. We've adopted, now, now think about this for a second. Let's say that uh, this crazy thing happens and God actually speaks to Morgan Philpot and says, Morgan, I want you to move out to uh, Timbuktu, Utah. Okay. So I move out to Timbuktu, Utah, and I show up, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to build a home. Woohoo! I'm going to be free. I start to build my home in the county in Timbuktu, Utah, comes out and says, oh, yeah. No, you can't build that. I'm like, no, I can't. God told me to come here. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't really care. That just makes you crazy. <laughs> we have this building code here that says you can't build that. I'm like, no, I'm serious. God really told me to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we might have to have you see somebody for that. If you build your house without our permission, according to our codes, we will come and arrest you. We'll charge you with the misdemeanor first, of course, right, before they arrest you. And I can't build my home now. Why not? 
because somebody in the legislature thought that if I did and didn't follow somebody else's rule made by an international building association, that I'd kill myself out in the middle of nowhere. So now that you know what they, I've had this happen actually, you know what they said to me? What happens if we got to get a, a fire truck up here to you? What happens if we got to send an ambulance out to you? And I said to them, I said, just, you can just let me die. I'm okay with that. <laughs> All right, we can't do that. It's illegal. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. So, you know what? Um, th those are model laws. And model laws come from outside the state of Utah. So when 2020 hit, I looked at COVID, the COVID response, and I went, this is uh, the product of model laws. And model laws, if subtly laid, trigger other laws to create outcomes that are hidden from the average person. So, for example, when we do an executive order like we did in the state of Utah, it triggers other things. It cites certain codes, and those codes get us to, from a state of emergency to, what did we go into? Martial law. We were in martial law in Utah. How many of you growing up thought someday I'm going to live in Utah, be told I can't go to church, can't go to the temple, and be put under martial law by a bunch of LDS men and women? No. Because that's what we teach in the church. Force and compulsion and reigning with blood and horror through laws that people don't understand, made by secret organizations outside the state of Utah. That's exactly what we believe in. Because we as LDS people don't have any teachings against such things. In fact, we've never been warned to watch out for secret organizations which make <laughs> secret combinations which govern how we can live and where we go to church. Right? I've never heard, heard in church. Never heard? Yeah. <laughs> so, so in 2020, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Um, what is this? And as I start to dig through the law, I actually got asked to file a lawsuit. I started to dig through it, and I started looking at all the laws that were triggered, and guess how long ago they started putting these laws in Utah code? After Brigham Young. 20 to 30 years ago. Started laying the foundation for COVID-19 20 to 30 years ago. Now, how in the world did that happen? Now, I then took three states and three states only. I didn't try to go any farther than this. Utah, Idaho, and Arizona. And I found out that all three of those states, all, brought outside CDC intelligence officers inside their states and put those people in charge of their COVID response. <laughs> CDC intelligence officers. That's interesting. The Arizona Emergency Director resigned in protest for violation of long-standing emergency protocol in Arizona because of it. So 2020, uh, not to mention, I mean, uh, I don't expect anybody to believe this, but I'm going to say it and you can go research it later. Utah, um, okay, well, let, let me do this. I'll do it in a different way. California and Florida took in 2020 alone, I'm just talking 2020, California and Florida took respectively $22 billion and $47 billion in COVID relief money. Now, those are the two highest states. I'm lying. There was one state that took more. New York. Utah. Now, guess how much they took. A hundred and five billion dollars. We recorded five of it on our books and laundered a hundred billion dollars through an industrial bank in Utah in the name of health savings account. And in October of 2021, they disappeared the entire hundred billion dollars and you can't even find it anymore. They don't even claim it. It's gone. It's not even on the website. It used to be on the website. You go right to the website and see Utah. 2020, $105 billion. Now, that's kind of crazy, right? And maybe it's innocent, but you don't do that kind of thing without some sort of public input, accountability, and transparency. Utah also, because of martial law, allowed our governor to enter into, without any legislative or uh, oversight of the people, 
a contract with the Rockefeller Foundation, who just so happens to write a lot of model laws, and they bought 500,000 rapid antigen tests from the Rockefeller Foundation under secret agreement. Now, how much do you think we paid the Rockefeller Foundation for all those model laws they've been writing for the last 100 years? Who knows? We don't get to see it because we went into martial law and the governor can pretty much do anything he wants. So I, I see all this and, and I've got a, a, an extensive enough background to, to kind of go, yeah, something's wrong. <laughs> and so I kind of looked up to heaven, maybe for the first time in my life, really, right? And, and I realized I'd made a, a fairly grave mistake in life. I had dedicated almost my entire life to politics and law. And most people would say, wow, that's, that's a reputable profession. We tease lawyers a little bit, but nobody complains about the money they make, right? And so when your kid goes and becomes a lawyer, everybody kind of goes, oh, you've got a kid who's a lawyer. Why don't we say, oh, so you belong to uh, the practitioners of the dark arts? <laughs> I'm so sorry your child chose a Luciferian profession. <laughs> we don't do that. Why? Now I could, I'm not joking actually. Um, it, it, any lawyers in the room? Okay. <laughs> what, what happens when you walk into a court of law? Who can sit in the gallery? Anybody. Oh, Who can go past the bar? Just you. <clears throat> Only the lawyers. You have to be a lawyer to get into the terrestrial kingdom of the court. Okay? Once you get past the lawyer's desk, there's a thing called the well. Who can go into the well? Judge. Nobody without the judge's permission. Where does the judge sit? On his throne. Up or low? Higher. Uh, what color do they wear? Black. Black. What? That's interesting. Minister so you mean to tell me that there's three degrees of a courtroom presided over by a person in a black robe? And what do they do when they want to get you into the courtroom? How do they do it? Subpoena. Subpoena. Subpoena is the method of delivery. They summon. Summon. What, what, where's that from? What do you summon? Oh, the ancient seance. I remember what? those. You summon them. And, and in order to get the body into the room, you don't call it a body. What do you call it? Vessel. A corpus. What? Oh, it's corpus. To have the corpse. Bring the dead body. Seance, summon the dead body. Bring it before the one in black in the three levels of the courtroom. And let us tell them what's going to happen. See, now God doesn't like that, because God made all of you what when he created you? <clears throat> a living soul. Not a corpus. See, and when God made you, he gave man dominion over the whole earth. And when you step into a courtroom, you need an attorney because you don't have the first clue about your rights. Because you don't care. Because you want to go to Disneyland, you want to own a boat, you want to have a nice car, and you want to own a 10,000 square foot home like the people in Alpine and Draper. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's who we are. That's the LDS people. That's what we've become. And we've created BYU in the name of Brigham Young, who's got to be just going nuts about that place right now. <laughs> Where... We teach all of our kids. All right, let me let me do a little test real quick. Okay, how many of you know what an atom is? A T O M. What's an atom made up of? Electrons, neutrons, and protons. Why do you believe? Such a, such a nonsensical thing. It's yeah. absolute nonsense. But you all believe it. It's science. Okay, let me ask you this. What's the motivational force of the atom? Light. Energy. It's the electron. It's energy. What is energy? Light. Okay, wait, so you, wait a sec. You mean to tell me 
that in every single atom in the universe, there's a piece of light and energy? That in all things, through all things, is a piece of light that animates every single atom in the universe? Why do you call that an electron? The Lord doesn't call it that. He calls it the light of Christ. Why have, you, why have we allowed our children to be taught that the light of Christ is an electron? Why? Because you're not allowed to teach that an electron is the light of Christ. Right? And if you do that as a teacher, you're going to get in trouble. So a child who goes to a government indoctrination center and they ride a, a prison bus literally painted yellow <laughs> to make everybody feel better about the prison bus that their kid rides to the penitentiary down the street that the kid can't leave. <coughs> and if your kid leaves too many times, what happens? There's truancy laws. And then your kid gets called into juvenile court and... And, of course, the men won't go because we don't pay attention to anything with our kids anymore. <laughs> We're gone all the time, and they're gone all the time. And so mom is the one who has to go to juvenile court with the kid. And when you get to juvenile court and you try to walk in with your kid, guess what they do? Oh, no. Hold on, mom. You're not allowed to go. Your kid is brought into the jurisdiction of the court and given another attorney, and mom is a secondary <clears throat> citizen in this situation. I've been there. I've seen it. So why why do we do this? Why do we do these things? Because the child in your when you got married, your certificate says that your children are the actual property of the state. Yeah, what, so so back to you know, back to my point, what we did a long time ago is we all acquiesce to a system we don't understand and so you hire us attorneys because we take the time to try and understand it. I remember one of the first times I ever went into criminal court, and there was a woman who had uh, living in Sandy who had been called into court, and she was, I kid you not, she's like this little Mormon woman, right, Relief Society, and here she is like this, and she's just like, oh, you know, and I'm like thinking, what did this lady do? Like, this lady's like peddling cocaine out of her house. And you know what happened? Her dog went to the bathroom in the neighbor's yard, which is against Sandy ordinance, and she got cited. And she's there thinking she's going to prison. And the prosecutors, this is how they work. They come out and say, we, we're not going to. If you'll pay a fee, $230, you know, we'll let this go. And she's like, you will? Oh. And she's like, this. she's like, oh, my gosh. Oh, I, oh, thank you so much. Thank you for taking my money for your stupid nonsense and letting me go. <coughs> But she was grateful because she had no idea how to defend herself. And so what do, you, what do you call that when people don't understand their rights, don't take hold of their dominion, and claim their living soul status? It's called acquiescence. And when you acquiesce, you have turned your sovereignty over to somebody else to tell you how it is. Now, surely, this never happened in the scriptures, because the scriptures aren't political, right? <laughs> and here's what's crazy, they're not. Because even using that word <coughs> is a dirty thing to do. I'll, I'll prove it to you, watch this. How many of you know when Joseph Smith lived generally? What year? 1844. So, how many of you have heard of Webster's 1828 Dictionary? Yes. All right, what's wonderful about Webster's 1828 Dictionary is it's written as a contemporary document to Joseph Smith. It is generally regarded as 16th century English, which if anybody's ever heard of Royal Skousen, guess what the Book of Mormon is written in? 16th century English. So if you want to understand a word that's in the scriptures, something that's really helpful to do is go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary and see what the meaning of that word was in that time. So did Joseph Smith know the word politics? 
Well, we, we don't know for sure, right? We can probably go to his records and see if he used it, but one thing we can do is we can see that the word politics was in regular use in the 1800s, obviously, and everybody knew it. And so why didn't Joseph Smith put the word politics or politic or political in the Book of Mormon? So I'm going to do a quick search in the Gospel Library application, politics, so I catch all of them. And I'm going to go over to the scriptures to refine my search because I want to see how many times does the Book of Mormon use the word politic. So here we go. There it is. Why? Here's why. Joseph Smith was born in 1805. He was foreordained to be a prophet of God, to write, to reveal, and to restore. His satanic counterpart was born in 1818 on an entirely different continent, and he wrote and revealed and what's the other word i just used restored okay and here's why restoration was needed for the devil prior to 1776 if you're the devil who do you work through to perpetuate your reign of terror kings, kings. but in, no, you don't need communism why because you have kings you've got kings and tyrants <laughs> But these pesky rabble-rousers in America create this thing called a republic, which has three branches of government, and who invented those? Yeah. Why do we teach in school the Greeks and the Romans did that? Because all you got to do is go to the Old Testament and find out that God is the lawgiver, God is our king, and God is our judge. There's your three branches of government in the Old Testament because the Hebrews knew them. But we give credit to the Greeks for some reason. Okay, so um, i got to be careful when I go down a little rabbit hole because then I forget where I'm at. So, politics. Uh, kings, okay. Why would you need restoration? Well, because of those pesky revolutionaries. And they created this thing called a constitutional republic. And once they did that, all of a sudden people over in France are like, hey, we should uh, have a constitutional republic. But what's the problem with uh, France? You've got this crazy lady named Marie Antoinette, and she likes to have people eat cake, and so this guy Robespierre, right, and all these others need to kill her because she's crazy. Right? Well, what was Marie Antoinette really doing? She was a good person. She was a good person. And she was taking the monarchy and turning it into a republic more similar to the American Republic. And the Jacobins and the Illuminati who had, Im who had infiltrated France didn't like that. And so they, through secret combinations and murder, had her killed. Well, later she appeared to somebody in the St. George Temple and got her temple work done. Go look at the names. She's on there. Marie Antoinette is one of the people who appeared to Wilfred Woodruff. Now, that's interesting because you're not going to learn that side of her at school. Well, the, the reason restoration for the devil is needed after the restoration of the gospel is how do you uh, penetrate these new democracies and republics with your system of corrupting kings and monarchs? You need a new system by which to not go after kings, but go after populations. Populations who have been generally set free through democracy, which is not understood today, uh, but, but it's easy to use. So, so the devil needs a restoration. He puts his prophet into the world in 1818. And what will happen between 1805 and 1844 is Joseph Smith will do some amazing things. And one of them can be seen in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 45. Now look at the date on this. 1831, okay? Think about that. Keep that in mind. In 1831, Joseph Smith is warning people in Europe to do what? To flee. To leave. Mm -hmm. Get out of Europe. And come over here to the um, Americas. <clears throat> now, 
why would he do that? Well, he tells them, um, I, I'm not going to go there now, but he basically lays out these prophecies that bad things are coming. 1844, Joseph Smith is dead, but he is published, he is editorialized, and he is revealed, and he is restored, and he's created a church on the Western uh, Hemisphere, which will go from about 16,000 members to, uh, in, I think it's in the 40s, 1940s, about, I think, 3 million. I, I may be getting that number wrong. And they will... Most of those members will be in Utah where European refugees fled because apostles and prophets of God came over to England and Europe and told them, come with us. And they did. Well, starting in about 1844, a guy named Karl Marx uh, starts to write his greatest works. Uh, I think the Communist Manifesto, Das Kapital... And by 1944, communism will spread throughout all of Europe and China. And in the time in which the Mormons will gather a humble, meager number of people, uh, communism will murder a hundred million people throughout the East. So Karl Marx is a far more effective prophet, right? Because he successfully killed a hundred million people with his doctrine, where Joseph, by 1944, only converted about two to three million. 1947, we reached uh, one million. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, it's an interesting paradigm when you compare these two prophets, right? One who does a work of restoration to convert, and the other one who does a restoration of work to literally reign with blood and horror and murder people throughout the world. Now, sadly, that doctrine, after 1944, left Europe, because it had succeeded, and came here, and infiltrated our nation. And this crazy man in Washington, D.C., got up and said, the commies are here, the commies are here, and had these Senate hearings, and everybody went, oh my gosh, you're crazy. And they politically assassinated him, and to this day, his name is held in, uh, is, is derogatory. Senator McCarthy, the McCarthy trials. All right, so, so what an interesting contrast. And, and Karl Marx would make, would make this uh, quote, he, he would pin this quote. And I'm not going to get it right. I could, I could go find it on my phone and get it exact for you, but I'll just tell you generally. He said, we've got to take uh, re, uh, theology and turn it, the criticism of theology, and, and think of that term criticism in the old school way, not the modern way, more like the study, right? The, uh, you're struggling with it to understand it. He wanted to turn the study of theology into the study of politics. He literally wanted to eliminate the ability to study theology and instead speak from the perspective of politics. That's the word he wanted to use. He didn't want the word religion in use. He wanted us to discuss law instead of religion. So now, why doesn't the Lord use the word politics in the Book of Mormon? Because it's a bastardization of something that we should be talking about, which is theology. And instead of a politician sending out a brochure with the, you know, the best angle on their face and saying, I support education. Because they all do, right? They all support education. And instead of saying, you know, instead of saying that, why aren't they saying something like, I love Jesus. <laughs> big letters on the front and then you open it up and says my goal is to support the church in restoring the kingdom of God on earth what would happen to them they'd be laughed at we would never elect such a person so when I was a state legislator I never said that I never got up in front of the Utah house and bore my testimony but I do remember 
sitting in the back lobby one day, and Elder Faust, who remembers Elder Faust? His president at the time comes in, and one of the other legislators who's a Democrat, I'm, I'm like 28 at this time, so I'm young and dumb. He says to him, uh, Elder Faust, I understand you used to be a Democrat. And Elder Faust says, I have risen above such things. <laughs> Dead serious. Now, being the stupid kid I was, my first thought was, I wanted to jump over and say, so you've become a Republican. I didn't, thank goodness. But think about politics. Think about what we demand of our politicians. What do we demand? What do we demand of our legal system? Benefits. Yeah, yeah stuff. Why? We love, we love stuff. Anybody ever tried to homestead or go off grid? Oh my gosh. Getting water? When, when you go out and don't have water, the first time you see water come out of the ground, you want to cry. It's a miracle. You ever tried to go to the bathroom without a toilet? Scouts have. It's not fun. How about taking a shower? How do you like that? Man, you go out into the middle of nowhere and try to build those things for yourself, it is really tempting to go back to Babylon. Because you know what Babylon sells and they're really good at selling? Showers, Showers toilets, <laughs> electricity, <laughs> electricity. refrigerators. It is so nice. Oh. Right? And and we and and not only that, not only do we have that stuff, we've got restaurants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So nice. What did the children of Israel say when they got out in the wilderness? Where's the Walmart? Remember, there's this funny term in the Bible. Yeah, what did you do to us? They were called the flesh pots of Egypt. The restaurants. They were called flesh pots because they cook all the meat right in the middle. You go down to the restaurant, you can dip your yummy, savory meat in Egypt, and they get out with Moses, and he's making them pick up this stuff off the ground. There's even a point in time where the manna has a dark color to it. And they're like, oh, seriously? Now it's got a dark color to it. You know, that was Israel. They're so lame. But look at us. I mean, okay. You see what I'm wearing tonight? This is dressed These up. are uh, designer pants. Uh, they're a brand called Fjall Robin. Very expensive. I love them. Try to wear them working in the country. Any excavators in the room? Watch those people laugh at you when you come out dressed like this. Because you are not ready to do anything except walk around in Babylon being like, hey, hey, hey look at me. Right? And that's who we are today. And we send our kids to college. And what do our kids want to do at college? Dress as nice as they can, wear the best cars they can, and make as much money as they can. Because we teach them from a very young age to violate the Ten Commandments where it says, thou shalt not covet. That's how we entice kids to go to college, by the way. Right? Yeah. How many of you, when you get your kids set down and you say, hey, I want to help you go to college, you're like, look, you need to be exalted. Um, you need to become like Jesus. And for that reason, you need to go become a lawyer. <laughs> and we got to do an application to Harvard because Harvard creates the best Jesus lawyers. <laughs> do you have that conversation? No. no. You tell your kid, hey, you want to marry a good looking chick? Yeah, you better make money. Uh, by the way, you don't want her to nag at you for the rest of your life? You better make more money. Uh, by the way, look at the guys next door. You want to have a house like them in Alpine? You know how much money you got to make? Do you want to live in Alpine these days? You seen the houses they're building up there on the cove? Oh my goodness. It's unreal. I'll never be good enough. I can't afford that. Right? I mean, that's what we teach our kids. I, well, maybe maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm the only one who looked at my life and said I want to be a lawyer and live in Alpine someday. And then I get to Alpine, I look around, I'm like, these people are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, Alpine. I was one of you. And in 2020, I woke up and I said, I got to get out of here because these people love money more than they love God. I'm, and again, I'm not speaking individually. I'm speaking collectively. And that's what we as an LDS people have done as well. Okay, now watch this real quick. Let me find one more thing for you. See, these politics are all over the scriptures, but God doesn't like that dirty word. So he calls them for what they are. 
Any else? Thank you. Okay, who killed Christ? The people. Which people? Jews. Romans. Wasn't the Jews? Romans. It was the Romans. What did the Lord call the Romans? Jews had the choice. Okay, I'm. All right, let me get the right place. All right, there it is. Okay, watch this. I might be in the wrong chapter. I thought I, oh, I think I need to be in Matthew. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Let's find that Caiaphas. Watch this. This is uh, Matthew 26. Sorry, my, my iPad is not updated to my phone. And so my phone, I can go right there because I got it highlighted. <coughs> And I think I'm in the wrong chapter. Oh, shoot. It says Matthew 26. Yeah, I... Sorry, where, let me do this. Well, I really want to show you that Caiaphas, though. It's so good. Let me, bear with me for a second. Um, where is it where Christ calls the Romans Gentiles? Who was that? You get the helpful award for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Matthew 20. Let me look at Matthew 20. Let me try that one real quick. All right, there we go. Matthew 20, verse 31. This, this is not the Caiaphas one. I do want to find that, but look at Matthew 20, starting in 25. No, oh, oh, there we go. That's good. Look at verse 19. This is Christ prophesying his own death. He's prophesying that he shall be delivered to the Gentiles to be crucified by the Gentiles. The Romans didn't do it. Or sorry, the Jews didn't do it. They kind of did. This is, uh, if you've got a good lawyer in the room, they'll... They'll argue fault here. And, but, but look who actually did the killing. Now, um, this is... Now watch what comes out of this. This is Yeah, they are co-conspirators. The Lord doesn't just refer to the Romans once as Gentiles. Here's the second time. Jesus... Okay, now, if you know the background of this story, uh, the mother of James and John, the sons of thunder, right? Uh, Zebedee's the mother comes to Christ and she's like hey I, I know you're the man will you make sure my son sit on your right and left hand or right hand and remember what he says to her <coughs> uh, you don't understand that's for my father to decide and all the other apostles are like ah ha ha you know and they kind of get mad at them and this is Christ's response he says don't do that because you know that that's what the princes of the Gentiles do. The Gentiles exercise dominion over each other. That's what he's saying. And they that are great exercise authority over them. So not only do the Gentiles have this practice of exercising authority over each other, they put people in positions to exercise even more authority. So he says... It shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. This is a definitively political statement. Don't be like people who go to the voting booth to enforce their ways on other people. That's what the Gentiles do. Don't be like the Gentiles and use force to make other people do what you want. Instead... He says, my followers should minister to each other, and those who are greatest will serve. We don't, we don't do that. How many of you, if you could stop paying your taxes, would? <laughs> hey, how many of you believe you have a First Amendment right? 
How many of you believe that churches and temples were closed in 2020? Do you want to reconsider your First Amendment right? Okay, how many of you believe you have a Second Amendment right? First Amendment, you have a right, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom to worship. So if somebody is taking your money and using it to kill other people, that is morally unconscionable, and you don't have to pay taxes. And then if they try to make you, you have a Second Amendment right to pick up your gun and defend your First Amendment right. And if you do that, they will kill you. So don't do that. Okay? Because you don't have a First Amendment right, and you don't have a Second Amendment right. We took that away from you a long time ago. Uh, we took that away from each other a long time ago. And who did that? Our votes. Yeah, we did it by our votes. And, and maybe you and I didn't do it, but over 150 years, we have gradually voted away everything our founding fathers knew as fundamental liberties. Now, what if, okay, I, I'm gonna, I gotta show you one more thing. Um, if I can find it. Was it Matthew 26, 57? Is that the Caiaphas one? Yeah, and also 26, 3. I think 57 is the one you Okay. Okay, I do like three. Look who the high priest is. It's Caiaphas. Okay. Now, watch what, uh, what was the verse? 50, 57. 57, thank you. Yeah, 57. Okay. No, um, that's not the one. Um, sorry. He's it's, also in John 11. John yes, 11. this is it, because it's the Lazarus moment. Oh, man, that, I don't know why. I read the Lazarus story today, and it just, like, tugged at my heart um, for the first time. And, and maybe it was that that caused me to finally see this. One of them named Caiaphas being the high priest. This is right after, okay, right after Christ. Um, let's, let's go back a little bit. Okay. Think, think about this story. Lazarus is dead four days. He's in a tomb. Christ starts coming to where Lazarus is from. Martha comes out to meet him first. And what does she say to him? If you had been here... He probably would not have died. And that's she's not she's not blaming him. She's in in my opinion, she's glorifying him. You could have saved him. It's too bad you weren't here. And he says, Well, do you know who I am? She says, Oh yeah, you are Christ, the Son of the Living God. And Christ groans. Why? Because she still doesn't get it. And then he says, Go get Mary. And Mary comes, what does Mary say? If you had been here. We know he wouldn't have died because you're Christ, son of the living God. And he sighs. Why? So then he raises Lazarus from the dead. And there are Jews there who are reporting back to the leaders of the Jews. And they go back. And they gather the chief priests in a council and said, what do we do? He's the Savior. That's what they're saying. He does the miracles. You can't contest. He just raised the guy from the dead after four days. He's officially dead. In Hebrew law, that dude's officially dead. Only God could have done that. And they come back and they say, we're wrong. This guy's God. That's the conversation that's going on. And, and look at the response. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You don't know anything. Listen to me. This is what we're going to do. Right? You can picture this conversation. Shut up, you guys. Listen. Here's what we're going to do. Okay. You don't consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Where does that come from? Oh. Tell me Joseph Smith is this smart. Because this is not just a ripoff. Of Nephi. Nephi is not just ripping this off. It is diametrically opposed in philosophy. Do you see why? What are they proposing? That they kill him. So that kill the, him why? So that the rest Save of the people nation. don't listen to him. Save our nation. Now you've got to qualify Nephi's revelation. Look at Nephi's revelation. 
Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. What the Jewish leaders are saying, it's better that one man die and that we perish in unbelief. But that's not the proposal because nobody would buy that. It's better that he die than we lose our power. 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 And the Romans take it from us. Wow. This guy's got to die. And then guess what Caiaphas does? This, the, the profound implications of what is happening in this very moment should instruct us all in our behavior related to the church at all times. Okay? Because the Lord's a complex guy. And one of them named Caiaphas says, hey, you don't know anything. Uh, here's why he's got to die. And then look what he does. He spake not of himself, but because he was high priest, what did he do? He prophesied. He began to prophesy. Why did he begin to prophesy? Because he was the high priest. And he was wrong. Until he had the Spirit of God come upon him in his keys as high priest, and he prophesied the truth, and look at what happens when the Spirit does come upon him. Jesus should die for the nation. True. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel to put him to death. Spirit comes down on Caiaphas, gives him a divine revelation that is the truth, and in light of the truth as the high priest Caiaphas says, we're going to kill him anyway. Ouch. You, you see what's happening here. Who are these guys? <clears throat> it's not good. Okay. So, so then, out of these instances, right, these, these are all connected. They're all related to Lazarus. It's the, it's the beginning of the end for Christ, the seven days leading up to him uh, basically dying on the cross. And we get the revelation in this moment that the Jews have made a choice to no longer be a spiritual people, but to give themselves over completely to politics. Completely. So, you know, when, it, when a nation makes a choice to give itself over to politics, workings in the dark, workings from abroad, model laws brought to us that we don't understand, we need lawyers to defend our rights, what's happened to that nation? And then the nation now takes their children and sends them to school in masks, right, by force, and we accept it. And then we close our temples, and then we close our churches. What, what is that? What's happening there? Why did we do that? Trusting our flesh. Okay, but so we didn't get yeah, we from the government. That's you, good citizen. Oh, yeah. good citizen. To preserve the church. Preserve the church. Now, most people didn't do it for that reason. I wish we had. If we had, we'd have been right. Because the church is fundamentally different than the people. Right? What is the church? Church is a corporation. Church is a corporation. Literally, it's uh, called the, if I remember right, it's the corporation of the first presidency organized in the state of Utah. Yep. It is also a... 501c3 organized under the laws of the United States through the IRS tax code. Not very impressive. So believe in the gospel, not the church. And the gospel is conducted through the third thing that the church is, keys. Keys. Okay, now, any lawyers know the case of Johnson v. McIntosh? Would have been your property classes. Fundamental case in United States court uh, case law. John Marshall, one of the greatest Supreme Court justices, justices in the history of the United States, in that case, he says, ultimate title to all property in the United States belongs to the United States government. Why? Not because God made us a people and gave us stewardship over the land. He says, because we took it by blood and horror. Conquest and dominion. That was the law. We killed them. We took it. It's ours. The government owns it. So, who owns the 501c3? <clears throat> Who owns the corporation? Who owns the keys? God. 
Can they take the corporation? Can they take the 501c3? Yes. Can they take the keys? No. 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 So once you see the how, how does God speak in scripture of governments? They're always represented in a in a certain form in scripture by a beast. And when I say a beast, I mean like an eagle, a lion, a bear. So all the kingdoms of the earth in scripture are typically represented as beast kingdoms. The kingdom of God is never represented as a beast. Okay, so once you allow the beast to control the church, you got a problem. Because what does God tell the church to do? Article of faith number 12. Be subject. What does God tell um, Esther to do? Be subject. Purify yourself before the government and do what it says. In this case, it was uh, Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus. And she presented herself in purity to a relatively wicked guy. But there's another part of the Esther story. Who is it? Her uncle. Who is Mordecai? Okay, if Esther's the church, the and Ahasuerus is either is a symbolic representation of both God and degenerate government, who's Mordecai? Christ. Look at this. Let's go to the um, book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price. <laughs> Moses chapter 6, look at this statement right here in verse 7. Now this same priesthood, which was in the beginning, shall be in the end of the world also. Okay, how uh, English teachers, how do we understand what he's saying there? We need some context so we go back and find out what priesthood, right? So in order to understand what priesthood he's talking about, we should probably go back and read verses 1 through 6. So we go to 1. And it says, Adam hearkened unto the voice of God. Adam knew his wife. She bare a son, called him Seth. God reveals himself to Seth. Seth has a kid. And God begins uh, to, uh, these men, in similitude of their father, begin to call upon the God of their fathers. And they are blessed for that. And God commands these men to keep a book of remembrance. So from the very beginning, God says to these men, keep scripture, keep a record. Now, look at what he says they're supposed to do with that record in verse 5. <clears throat> Sorry, verse 6. Teach your children from that. So God commands men to teach their children to read and write from what? So in Utah, what's amazing is we, as Latter-day Saints, believe in our scriptures, and so we have a law that mandates all schools will teach children to read and write from the scriptures. Wow. I'm joking. We don't. Because we don't believe in our scriptures. We don't follow them. We, we don't pay that much attention. So what priesthood is he talking about? Now we get to seven. Now this priesthood. What priesthood? He didn't mention priesthood. The father being? Patriarchal. Or a patriarchal priesthood. A priesthood that passes from father to son. What is the Melchizedek priesthood? Specifically, not that. It is not passed by mother or father. So, here we have a prophecy going all the way back to the first men on this earth, that this type of order will be in the end. Now, why would that matter? If I were to say to you, what is government? Give me the most fundamental definition, Kimball. An agreement amongst individuals about how to associate with each other. Okay, I, I agree with that, and I would call that a legitimate form of government in similitude of the real government, if done righteously, like Israel organized in tens. So now I would say, and challenge you further, what is that modeled after? 
There is only one legitimate government in the entire universe. The family? It's not a family because you're you're not a democracy, right? It's called, we, we call it parenting. Parenting. It's the union of a mother and father into a unity by which they govern their own children. That's what he's teaching us right here. That is government. Right? There's no such thing as government as we teach it today. You can't take somebody's rights by force and take their children and tell them how to teach their kids, raise their kids, and what to do with their kids. If you do... You're not following the Lord's plan. So this priesthood is supposed to be in the end. Okay, now, why would... All right. All right. So 2020, we basically do the opposite. We, uh, through... I'm guessing none of you here really had an active voice in the COVID lockdown. <laughs> so you were just a victim of it, like I was. Well, knowing what I did in 2020, I, I looked at myself, and remember President Nelson's remarks in April of 2020 when he asked us all to fast? And he asked us to consider uh, a, making a sacrifice. I, 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 for the first time, some things, I don't like to talk about certain things, so you get a little teary-eyed sometimes. I'm trying not to. Take a big breath. Okay. Um, I, I, I've never had a testimony of Christ. Kind of a weird thing to say, right? Because you'd think that would be the first thing. My testimony was a lot different. It came uh, through a testimony of Joseph Smith and Ezra Taft Benson. And I always felt like I couldn't approach Christ. Because I always felt, um, I, I always felt unworthy. And he was way up here and I was you know, way down here. Um, and you know, no matter how much worldly confidence I had, I could never transcend that barrier. So you know, it wasn't until 2020 that I finally developed a testimony of Christ. And it was President Nelson's request to consider a sacrifice going into this fast. So I, I, have, a, I have an awesome truck. I love it. I've never had a, a car I really liked until this truck. And I, I didn't even really mean to get this truck. It was kind of an accidental thing. It's a Toyota Tacoma, I, I not, but it's like lifted, sweet tires, rack on the back, camping thing on it, you know, lights. It's awesome. Dirty. Oh, it's, yeah, it's dirty. It is dirty. It's become a farm truck. Um, and I, I was thinking, well, okay, what, what does the Lord want me to put on the line? Maybe I should sell my truck. And donate, um, sorry, you know, give the money to the church or something. And the Spirit's like, nah, the Lord doesn't want your truck. I'm like, okay, well, I, um, I could, uh, you know, I, I start going through this list of things. And I'm, I'm, the Spirit's like, nah, nah, the Lord doesn't want that either. I'm like, well, what does he want? And the Spirit's like, well, what he wants I'm like oh come on you know that's silly that's just stuff we say in church you know this is one of those dumb things we say everybody's like oh love Jesus what's the answer to everything in primary Jesus and I'm like that's just the answer we give and the spirit's like no that's what he wants I'm like that's that's impossible <clears throat> he doesn't want my sins that's that's trite stupid thing we say to make ourselves feel like we're better than everybody else, right? And Spirit's like, no, that's that's what he wants. And I'm like, that, that, I was like, if that's true, that makes him awesome. 
And Spirit's like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, hold on. You know, like, nobody does that. That's, and the Spirit was like, no. And uh, the Spirit's like, Morgan, um, I don't want you to go get your temple recommend. It's like, well, okay. Uh, that's what, you know, that's what makes me better than everybody else. I live in Alpine. I'm a lawyer. I got a hot wife and five good looking kids. And I got a temple recommend. I went on a mission. And I, you know, I'm too uh, controversial to be the gospel doctrine teacher, but generally I'm a pretty good guy. And I go to church every week. <laughs> I made it. Um, so, you know what? If you don't let me go get my temple recommend, then I can't, you know, be the thing I set out to be. That's, uh, Oh, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I can go to Disneyland every year, too. and So, you take that away from me? Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. Um, I want you to put all your sins on the altar, and you're not going back to the temple until you do. And I want you to go sit down and um, have a talk with your bishop. And I'm like, I'm, I'm Morgan Philpott. I'm a lawyer. I'm... I live in Alpine. I got a hot wife and five beautiful kids, and I don't need to do that. That's just some dumb thing we do, you know. That doesn't that doesn't mean anything. Now I want you to do that, and don't go back to the temple. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so, you know, I did, and uh, the outpouring. Of, you know, of love from the Lord, and the testimony of the Lord that I gained in that time was like nothing I'd ever had before. And so I always thought, you know, like my testimony of Joseph Smith was great, and my testimony of Ezra Taft Benson was great, and my testimony of the Book of Mormon was great, but the Lord, that's, he's amazing. And uh, the fact that he would ask that of me, I, I knew from that moment that Jesus <clears throat> is the Christ. That the only thing worth doing is building the kingdom of God. Nothing else is even close. There is nothing you can do except building the kingdom of God in your family, which is just the same thing. Nothing you can do that will ever compare to accepting that the kingdom of God must come. And in 2020, I think what the Lord said to me is, Morgan, the world's over. My kingdom's coming. You can get with me, or you can get left behind. So make your choice now. And I said, okay, well, I'm with you. What do you want me to do? And then I found this scripture. And it caused me once again to question my entire life dedicated to politics and law. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I thought I was you know, fighting for the Constitution. I was the Bundy's lawyer. I, I fought people who, you know, I fought cases you couldn't win. I hung out with people that only Jesus would hang out with. You know, that kind of thing. I thought I was great. And uh, I studied the Constitution. I felt like I'd read the scriptures. I'd, you, know, you know the story, right? So then I find this. Look at this verse. Verse 6. Eight, uh, sorry, DNC 87, verse 6. Uh, this is the culmination of Joseph's visions about what's going to happen in Europe. He includes the Civil War. Um, it's coming. Thank you. He includes uh, Europe. And basically, Joseph Smith, through, uh, through prophetic revelation, lays out the entire timeline of our world to this day in DNC 87 and here's the culmination of that vision and the culmination of that vision results in a full end of what nations. all nations is America included in all nations yes. Yes. so if I'm fighting to hold up America who am I fighting yeah, that's, that was a harsh realization for me. 
And uh, I realized that I had lived a relatively uh, deceived life. And I needed to repent desperately. And so I dug into these things uh, as fast and furious as I could, such that I kind of got a little frenzied for a while. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not ready. I, you know, I've read that verse says there will be men in standing that day shall look up to heaven, curse God, and die. And I thought, I don't want to be one of those guys. I don't want to fail my family. So what do I need to do? And so I started, you know, anybody ever heard of Jonathan Kahn? He's the Messianic Jew and author out of New Jersey. Amazing guy. And I got a, I have to also give a little credit to Jody Stoddard. I, I found one of her videos online and I watched it. And it was really good. And I was like, I'm not ready. So I started digging into books. I tend to read when I don't know something. And I found Jonathan Kahn's book called The Paradigm. Anybody read The Paradigm? It's, it's mind-blowing. And I was a little disappointed with myself after that book. Because I thought, here's a Messianic Jew from New Jersey, not Utah. <laughs> not a Messianic Jew who converted to Mormonism and moved to Utah. This guy doesn't have anything to do with us. And he's writing this book where he's showing that the ancient kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, specifically Ahab, you can take his life and line it up to Bill Clinton. And it's got these amazing parallels. And now, remember the story I started you with? Mm -hmm. the, my internship at the White House? Mm -hmm. I'm reading this book by this guy who's comparing Ahab and Clinton. And I'm like, I was an intern. for. I worked in the Council on Environmental Quality. I was the intern who got to read through documents nobody had ever seen on a little internal conspiracy in the White House regarding the designation of the Escalante Monument in Utah. Utah. And Ahab, not only did I see all these parallels between Ahab and Clinton, and Jezebel, Ahab's wife, and Hillary, Clinton's wife, that he lays out so wonderfully in this book, but I was like, wait, Ahab's that guy that conspired to take land from Naboth. And Naboth was God's guy. And he was the steward of God's vineyard. So not only, and Jonathan Kahn didn't see this, but I'm, I'm, I was there. And I'm like, that guy stole our vineyard by conspiracy. Just like, and I, I went, I was like so ashamed of myself because here was this guy, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the true church, right? I have the Holy Ghost. If he knows this, how do I not? Because we're supposed to know this, not him. And so I thought, well, what if we did and I wasn't paying attention? So I went all the way back, 2000, President Hinckley, and started reading President Hinckley's talks in conference. And guess what? President Hinckley was calling it. The stuff Jonathan Kahn's writing about after the fact, President Hinckley was prophesying about over the pulpit 20 years ago and I wasn't paying attention and so I said to myself I, I really got to repent and I dug in and let me just I'm going to show you a few examples okay I want to I want to introduce you briefly to four archetypes or four types and signs types and shadows <coughs> and the third to me is the most important okay one is the northern kingdom of Israel, the other is the southern kingdom of Judah, and the other is what I call the parable of the eagle, which some people associate in part with Ezra's eagle. But Ezra's eagle is just a piece of a much bigger picture. And then the fourth is the Book of Mormon. Now the Book of Mormon is the most correct, correct of any book on earth. What does correct mean? We go out to Webster's 1828 Dictionary and we take a look at that word. And if it is the most correct of any book on earth, then look at what it must do. 
If you can't see that, I'll, I'll read it. One, it must make things right and rectify them. Two, it has to amend or remove things that aren't true. Three, it has to bring back or attempt to bring back to propriety. And four, to obviate or remove whatever is wrong. Now, look at the first definition, to make right. What is right? Look at the will of God. Okay, where is it? Look at the first definition up top. In the literal sense, right is a straight line of conduct. Now think about that for a second. Not only must it amend and correct, it must set everything in line, straight. Therefore, all archetypes must go to the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon takes all those archetypes and sets them in line. And so I started to test that. And I'm going to show you just a little, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to run through, let me show you one more thing first before we jump into it. How many of you know what the fourth dimension is? Third dimension. Why do you speak of the fourth dimension? Why don't you say it in the way the Lord says it? Because you learned the fourth dimension of school, in physics probably, like electrons. Okay, here's the fourth dimension from the scriptural process. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Uh, here's another one. All things are present with me. So that's fourth dimensional processes. In fourth dimensional processes, you're not subject to space and time. Therefore, all things are present because you're standing outside space and time. So if God is writing the scriptures... <laughs> From a fourth dimensional perspective, and you're not thinking from a fourth dimensional perspective, guess what's not going to happen? Revelation. You are not going to understand. So how do you get in a fourth dimensional state? You can't. You're a third dimensional being. And only one thing can get you into that space. The Holy Spirit. So if you're not studying and reading and living with the Holy Spirit, you're just kind of rolling along like the Jews did under the carnal law. You're doing it because somebody told you to. If we get into that fourth dimensional process, um, then we can start to see that there are certain things which have always been before us. And we should have seen them long ago. Here is a picture of the 19 kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. Notice who the first is. His name is Jeroboam. Now, if I were to jump over into the scriptures, remember the prophecy that the truth will flood? What's it? Yeah, your gospel library app? And its search feature is a miraculous thing. And I, I'm not kidding. You know, remember how people used to outline their scriptures? Now you can do it. You have access to things that people couldn't even comprehend before this. So use it. So we're going to go in here and we're going to search for uh, uh, Jeroboam. Watch, watch this. Uh, Jeroboam is the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And look who promises Jeroboam that he's going to be king. Uh, okay, Jeroboam's a mighty man. A mighty man. Look who his mother is. She's a widow. Keep that in mind. And... Jeroboam is mighty, a mighty man of valor. That's what the Lord called Gideon. So the Lord is pleased with this guy. He went out of Jerusalem, and look who beats him, the prophet of God. And he says, 
you know, think about this. You got Saul, David, Solomon, and the son of Solomon, Rehoboam, and Rehoboam is the rightful king. And God comes to Jeroboam and says, I need you to take over. This is the system the Israelites begged for, and here's God coming to a guy outside the fatherly line and saying, you're going to take over. And Ahijah takes his garment and rends it in 12 pieces in similitude to what? Okay. Who else rends their garment? Joshua, Moroni. Follow that line. You'll learn more about Captain Moroni. Jeroboam says, take thee 10 pieces. So what's Jeroboam just been given stewardship over? Okay, now, this blew my mind. The place we call Israel today was never called Israel after this moment. What was it called? Judah. Judah. That's right. Israel was governed out of Samaria. It was the northern kingdom. So why do we call that place Israel today? Because politically, a bunch of people said that's what we're going to do. And that's not what they called it. The Israelites themselves didn't call today's Israel Israel. They called it Judah. Nephi was a Judean. And when you learn Nephi's method of defining a Jew, it's not a Jew, it's a Judean or a person who lives in the southern kingdom of Judah. So here's Jeroboam, who's given stewardship over the ten tribes and governs from the north. He's a son of a widow. He's an Ephraimite. He's a civil engineer, literally. And he uh, governs for 22 years. The Bible says he sets his hand against a king, and the king's name is Rehoboam. His name is Jeroboam. In America, we have a guy named George Washington, a mighty man of valor, an Ephraimite, called by God, who takes stewardship over the modern ten tribes of Israel. He sets his hand against a king across the ocean with the same name as him, and George Washington will serve in the top office, president and leader of the armies, for 22 years, just like Jeroboam, and he's a son of a widow. Just like Jeroboam, and he's a surveyor a civil engineer, just like Jeroboam. Wow. Now, I looked at that and I went, that's crazy. Okay, hold on. Because now what happens is Jeroboam turns Israel to wickedness. And I'm like, oh, that's not George Washington. So what's gone wrong here? But who put Jeroboam in place? The Lord did. So once Jeroboam goes to wickedness, that which the Lord has put in place is now at an end. And Israel turns to idolatry. So is George Washington the thing, or is he the manifestation of the thing that the Lord put in place? He didn't want to be president. No. And how long did we preserve his ways? They put him in president. Some man gave him power. Okay. So what's the thing God put in place? Constitution. Yeah, and yeah, the Declaration of Independence. He he's the one who established the government that was. And when did that government come to an end? I I, I kind of agree. I, I get where you're going. I kind of disagree, and here's why. The Lord justifies the Constitution in DNC ninety. Eight, I think. But he says, he warns, I, I, I'm okay with you befriending this, but anything more or less cometh of evil. Okay, when does that all fall apart? When does the Constitution literally cease in the United States of America? Civil War. Watch this. So, if Jeroboam is both George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, the thing which God set in place is over after we do what? Enslave an entire race of people and kill God's prophet, priest, and king. And drive God's people out of the United States of America. After 1844, America goes rapidly downhill, turns to civil war by the 60s, and then literally reforms itself after uh, in, under Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so Jeroboam, both... 
uh, begins America and ends America. But we got 19 kings of Israel. Now, if you've read the paradigm, if Ahab is Bill Clinton, who's after Bill Clinton? Bush. Who's after Ahab? Ahaziah. Who's after Ahaziah? Jehoram. Who's after Bush? Obama. Who's after Jehoram in the northern kingdom of Israel? A guy named Jehu. Who's after Obama? Trump. Trump. Jehu was a crazy man <laughs> living out in the desert. And a prophet of God goes out to Jehu and says, you're going to be the next king. And Jehu goes, nah, that'll never happen. And the prophet of God says, no, you are going to go be the king. And, and think about that again. Let's go. Uh, Jehu, okay, Jehu, Jehoram. Ahaziah, Ahab. There's two guys between Jehu and Ahab. Who do you think he tells to take out? Jehu says, Jehu, I need you to take down the house of Ahab. Not Jehoram, not Ahaziah, Ahab. Who does Donald Trump run against? Hillary. Not Obama, not Bush, Hillary. He doesn't attack the legacy of Obama, he doesn't attack the legacy of Bush. He completely goes after the Clinton dynasty. It was said of Jehu that when he came, nobody could predict what he was going to do. And he, they all knew Jehu because he drove his chariot furiously. <laughs> now that's probably just a coincidence, right? Watch this. How many kings of the northern kingdom of Israel were there? Nineteen. We can identify one. <coughs> Jehu. There he is, right up there. There's Jehu. Okay? Let's go back. Here's uh, So Jehu is number... Let me get the number right so we get it right. Uh, Jehu is number 10. Okay, so there's number 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Jeroboam. Jeroboam in the Lord's book is good or really bad? Really bad. Okay, let's start over because, right, let's follow the cycle, see if it maintains. Oh, where is my guy? There he is. Okay, 19. 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh. Bad. Look who we get to. It all lines up. It all lines up. And not only does it line up, go study the attributes of the northern kings of Israel and guess who they start to match up with. And it, you'll go down a rabbit hole for a year. And it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay, now it gets better. In 1958, National Geographic magazine published an article in National Geographic called Geographical Twins a World Apart. And they published these pictures. Utah's Jordan River, the Jordan River in Israel. Utah's Great Salt Lake and the Dead Sea. And then they published this map. With the two Dead Seas down at the bottom, the two seas of Galilee up at the top, correct, connected by a Jordan River with their capital city in approximately the same location. That's just an accident though, right? Yeah. Now, who can pronounce, okay, what's this, what's this kingdom called once the two split? The northern kingdom of Israel is north, and Judah. the southern kingdom is called Judah, which in Hebrew is pronounced what? Yehudah. Close. It is Yehuda. Why? Because you've got to pronounce that J. Or the Y. Okay, they're the same in Hebrew. Now spell for me Utah the way you say it. 
Y O O T A H. Now pronounce the Y in Hebrew. Yeah. Uda. Uda. You live in Yehuda. Now that's probably just a coincidence, right? Because the Mormons picked that name, didn't they? <coughs> no. The Utes did. The Utes did. We didn't name it. You can't blame us for the coincidence. And the Apache had a name for it. The Utes called it Utah, and the Apache called it Yi Utah He. That's funny because there's a He in Hebrew, which is the first letter of Hephraim, or the Aleph, Alephraim, who's the firstborn son of Joseph. And so you're telling me we have the Ye Uda and the He with the Apache? And guess what they call this place? Why do they call it Utah He? And why do the Utes call it Utah? Because it means the place on high, the, the people high up, or the place at the top of the mountains. All right, now go to Isaiah chapter 2 in the Old Testament. <clears throat> why am I? Okay, there we go which Nephi puts in the Book of Mormon. Okay, first look at this chapter. Pay careful attention, see if you catch it. The vision of Isaiah when? Days of Uzziah. Concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah. Where was Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah? Over in the Middle East. Watch what Isaiah does. The word of Isaiah concerning Judah and Jerusalem when? In the last days. And where will Judah and Jerusalem be in the last days? Not in the mountains. Not just in the mountains, in the which is the meaning of the word Utah and Ute and Apache. So Isaiah sees Judah and Jerusalem and the mountain of the Lord's house established in the top of the mountains. President Hinckley read that verse in a solemn assembly in the year 2000 at the dedication of the conference center and said that that scripture was fulfilled in Utah. So where is Yehuda in the latter days? Right here. What is Jerusalem? What's the Jerusalem of the Book of Mormon? It's capital city is Zarahemla. Break that down to its Hebraic parts. Zara, He, there's that He again. Zara Hemla. Now He could be the breath of God infused into the middle of Zara and Mala. And Zara is princess or seed. So what is... What is a prince? Who's the if, if Zada is a princess? Who's the queen? God's queen is always the same city, Zion. And any city below Zion is a stake or a princess in biblical literature. So Zada, the princess of the He, breath of God, or Hephraim, and Mala, salt. So the salt city of the seed of Ephraim, or the people of God. That's what Zarahemla means. It's all pointing to something. And it isn't ancient Judah. Right? Remember Elder uh, Christofferson's talk about how it's time to get our cottage out of Babylon? Remember the quote from Joseph Smith about how all the prophets of the ancient days wanted to see the Lord, but all they can do is get him to give them a sight of our day? They're, they're not writing about ancient Israel in the scriptures. They are messianically, right? But what are they really writing about? They're writing about us. They're writing about the latter days. And here is Yehuda in the latter days. Now, this is Utah as a territory, not a state. And in ancient Israel, there was a reign of judges. And the first, if you study carefully, the scholars get it wrong. Just go check this in the Bible, okay? Once Joshua dies, <clears throat> Judah takes over as the first judge of Israel. And Judah is the 
Lion of the Lord. Who's the first territorial governor of Utah? The Lion of the Lord. Look at that. They match. And if not for the fact that Samuel and Joel and Abijah serve as a stint as judge, it wouldn't align. But for some weird reason, you get the book of Judges, then all of a sudden Samuel is like, oh, and I served, and oh, Joel and Abijah did, and nobody liked Joel and Abijah, so they demanded a king. Only for that reason do we match up in Utah. This is Utah as a state. The first governor of the state of Utah was Heber Wells. The first king of ancient Yehuda was Rehoboam. And there's us to current. There's only two left. And who's the last? Zedekiah. Now, Zedekiah is overthrown. It's actually Jehoiakim right here. Under his reign, Babylon basically locks down the southern kingdom of Judah. And Zedekiah doesn't like that lockdown. So Zedekiah rebels against Babylon. And Babylon invades and kills the children of Zedekiah in front of his face. Mulek escapes. And then they poke out Zedekiah's eyes with a hot poker. Now... These two guys right here, Jehoahaz, sorry, yeah, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim are really interesting. Because Jehoahaz is actually the brother of Jehoiakim. And Jeho, uh, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim are being controlled by Egypt. And Egypt thinks that Jehoahaz is too soft. And so they depose him. They're like, nah, you're out. We want him in because he'll do what we say better. And so this guy gets slipped in. Right? Now, what's weird about that, it's just a coincidence, is Spencer Cox wasn't Gary's original lieutenant governor. He donated $200,000 to Gary's campaign, and all of a sudden Bell was out and Cox was in. And now he's the governor. These two guys took a whole bunch of money and resources from Egypt. Those two guys brought $105 billion of COVID money and laundered it through the state of Utah. This guy was secretly supporting Egypt behind the back of the king of Babylon. Mm -hmm. This guy was openly supporting the king of <coughs> Egypt who deposed the king of Babylon. And now he, his choice runs the nation with dementia, which the fact that we believe that he's in charge is crazy. Um, it's, and that we live with it is crazy. So you know, these, these parallels get a little bit uncanny after a while. And then watch this. So when does, now imagine if this archetype and the northern kingdom of Israel aligned in the same year. Imagine if Jehu came to power in the same year as these two guys. What year did Trump come to power? 16. He took office in 2017. <laughs> what year did that guy get together with that guy? 2017. And what's weird about that is in 2017, on a Jewish holiday in September, something odd happened. And it hasn't happened for a long time. In September of 2017, the same year in which those two archetypes align, Virgo appeared in the heavens in the same formation as Revelation chapter 12. She appeared up in the sky with the, the sun at her shoulder, the moon at her feet, uh, Jupiter at her belly. You know the Hebrew name for Jupiter? Zedek. Zedek appeared at the belly of Virgo in 2017. And Leo aligned with the 12 stars, the 12, the crown of 12 stars in 2017. The last time that happened was in September of 1827 when a guy named Joseph Smith claimed to meet with Moroni 
and get the gold plates. Wow. 17 years after that date in 1827, <clears throat> Joseph Smith restored the kingdom of God on earth on March 11, 1844. Now, 2017 also saw a solar eclipse that cast a shadow across America from New York mm -hmm. to California. In 2024, seven, six and a half years later, that same thing will repeat, starting in Washington down to Florida. I think it's really And it will create an X. It, I may be wrong on the order. It'll create an X in, just on the east side of Missouri. And that happened on a Jewish holiday in 2017. In 2018, a guy named Russell Marion Nelson was sustained as the prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints after that, those two events. His name is French. It is Roselle. Uh, Roselle is the French masculine, Russell. Marion is the French masculine, Mary. And Nelson is Niall's son, which means the champion of the nail or the son of the champion. That's his name. Now, do you know who uh, Rose is in French mythology? She's the daughter of Mary Magdalene, who in French mythology and Templar mythology was married to a guy named Jesus Christ, who was the champion of the nail. That's just a coincidence, of course, in 2018. We have a little scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants that talks about this one mighty and strong. And everybody gets all freaked out about the one mighty and strong, and we get these apostate offshoots all over the place. But you know what the one defining factor of the one mighty and strong is? He will set in order the church of God, which implies that he has something, which none of these crazies have. He has keys to set in order the church of God. Who has keys to set in order the church of God? Russell, Mary, and Nelson does. Now, I'm not saying he's the one mighty and strong. I'm suggesting he's a type and a sign. Because it's God's pattern to pick 97-year-old men to do things you think, you know, the rock would do. Or to pick a 14-year-old boy to do it. And President Nelson gets in right after this. These big signs in the sky... And all of a sudden starts breaking apart the church and putting it where? In the, home. in the home. He starts to set in order the church of God. And coincidentally, his actions have wonderful ramifications because it prepares us by 2020 to start having church at home. And he tells us in 2018, hey, by the way, you better go get your testimonies uh, worked up because if you don't have the gift of revelation, you will not survive spiritually. And then the church starts to do all these crazy things. And people are like, ah, I don't know what to do. You know, and people are like, I'm going to leave the church. I can't, they're being political. And other people are like, I love it that they're being political. You know, and, and the, the wheat and the tares start fighting. And everybody goes bonkers. And I'm like, well, it's all just written. It's all right here. They're doing everything that's written in Scripture. There's no surprise here. So all I got to do to know what to do is do exactly what President Nelson said and go learn the Scriptures. So now I take these things, right, the southern kingdom of Judah, and I don't have time to do this tonight. And maybe another night we can run through the entire parable of the eagle. And it, it proves to the reasonable and spiritual mind that the Book of Mormon is true. It is amazing. I'll give you one little piece of it, okay? And we'll just do it right here from Revelation chapter 12. What is the woman that appears? Three years, oh my goodness. I don't know why I never thought of this before. The woman appears in the sky in 1827, right? What happens three years later? Church on a Tuesday in April. What happens three years after 2017 in April? COVID. And the church is brought into bondage. 
by a conspiracy that overflows the world. And what does Ether say and, and Moroni say in Ether chapter 8? When you see the secret combination spread over your nation, yeah. awake and arise. And then you have the story of Omer, who gets out. Okay, so <coughs> in, eight, in 1827, this appears in the sky. In 2017, this <coughs> appears in the sky. In 1827, the church will be organized three years later. And... What does the woman, the church, have upon her head? Crown. How many stars? Twelve. Okay, and how many of those stars will be drawn away? Third part. So how many is that? Four. Four. There's only 12 stars in Revelation 12. So don't start thinking that a third of the host of heaven fell. That's false doctrine. The Doctrine and Covenants proves it. Go study the Doctrine and Covenants. It'll talk to you about the a different third. It's a whole different subset. This is just 12. How many original apostles were there under Joseph? 12. 12. How many fell away and never came back? Four. Four. Joseph's a good guesser. <laughs> now, what rises up shortly after the church? A beast, an evil one, who's got a prophet that's born in 1818, who lives over in Europe, and his color is? Red. 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 red, and a red wave spreads across across the country that Joseph Smith says get out of. And so here comes the red wave in four, and then the woman brings forth a man child. Now the this was not readily available up until the Joseph Smith papers were released, and once the church started to publish the Joseph Smith papers, we got access to an organization called the Council of Fifty. And you can go to the administrative records of the Joseph Smith paper, volume 3, 1843 to 1844, where you will learn that on March 11th, 1844, jo Joseph organized the kingdom of God and the child was born on this earth on March 11th, 1844, who had the right to rule the entire world and Joseph Smith would be sustained in that year as king over the whole earth by the kingdom of God organized in that year. And then what would happen to Joseph Smith in June of 1827? He was caught up unto God. And because he was caught up unto God, the church fled into the wilderness in 1846 where God had prepared a what? And what did Brigham Young say when he rolled down into the valley? This is the place. The place that was prepared. And in heaven, because this is the archetype in heaven, the church was going to stay there for 1,203 score days. And what happens is they immediately jump us forward in time to an event that really doesn't have anything to do with the church fleeing into the wilderness. They say there was a war. And so this guy named Michael shows up. And Michael is to us spiritually what? Adam is to us temporally. So what is this event? This is the heavenly Adam on Diamond. Who shows up at Adam on Diamond? <clears throat> Adam. Who's going to lead the victory of the war on earth? It's telling us right here. But what John does is like, okay, that's heaven though. So now I got to bring you back down to earth. <laughs> because we won in heaven and the dragon got cast down to you guys. So now woe unto the earth. For the devil has come down to you, and you have a short time. And then he says, the woman is given two wings. That Here's the, where the parable of the eagle starts in the Bible. It's not Ezra's eagle. It starts here. It actually starts in Genesis and goes to Nephi, and then comes here. But we don't have time to do that tonight, so we're going to go here. Who's the great eagle? It's the United States of America. Who gives the saints permission to go? United States of America. Who gives the saints permission to create a territorial government? The Great Eagle. And how long does this woman have in this place she's going to? A time. It's not the same as in heaven where it was like 1,203 score days. 
On earth, she has a time, times, and a half a time. Now, in Leviticus, God commands Israel, when you go into the place I command you, you shall declare a jubilee and hold a Shemitah cycle. So in 1847, the saints roll down into the valley and the Shemitah cycle starts. And guess what the saints do in 1897? On the 50-year jubilee mark, they hold a jubilee in Utah, and they call it that. So what is a time? Years. 50 years. <laughs> How much is times? 100. Years. Two jubilee cycles. How much is a half a time? A half a jubilee cycle. 50 <clears throat> plus 100 plus 25. 1847 plus 125 is? 175. Wait, 175, sorry. I don't do math. No. 1840, 2022, in which the nourishment stops and the church loses its protection in Utah and the dragon comes again. You know what's happening in Canada? Canada just audited the church and is attacking the church as a government. What did we do in 2020? Made the First Amendment illegal shut down all churches and temples in the name of a public health emergency which became martial law. Of course the church is going to obey that. The Lord has commanded them to. It's part of the plan because it's in prophecy. We could jump over into Ezekiel where it would continue the story of Utah after 1847. And it would give you all the details of everything that happens to Utah after 1847 in Ezekiel 17. It will then segue you just like the northern kingdom of Israel does and just like the southern kingdom of Judah does into the Book of Mormon. And what's the year with the grand signs? 2017. Why did God put the stars and the planets in the heavens according to Moses? For signs and for seasons. What is the season word in Hebrew, it's moad, uh, mo, moadim, moed, and it means appointed time. So God put the stars for signs and for appointed times. So let's jump over to the Book of Mormon. We got a problem though. In Hebrew and Nephite, they don't have zeros. Why? You know the answer to this. Joseph Smith taught it. There is no such thing as ex nihilo creation. You don't create something out of nothing. Therefore, there's no such thing as zero, and the Hebrews and the Nephites believe that. So do the Hebrews and the Nephites have a year zero? No. They begin their new millennium as one. How did we start our new millennium? At zero. With a zero. So they begin with a one, we begin with a zero. Keep that in mind, okay? Keep, just hold that thought. In the year 2000... President Hinckley held two solemn assemblies in April and October. He held the first solemn assembly in Palmyra, New York. What does Palmyra mean? City of Palms. What? Now, this is a, if you know this, I'll be, I'll be impressed. What's the City of Palms in the Bible? No, it's That is correct, but it's not the biblical one. It's recognized as a Roman Jer province primarily. Jer There's another one. Who Jer said that? Jericho. Jericho. Oh. Jericho means city of palms. Okay, you all know Christ's seven day final week, right? <clears throat> he goes purposefully somewhere before he begins his final seven days, and guess where it is? Jer Jericho. Jericho. And. He begins in Jericho. Now, if I were to say to you, a certain man went down from Jerusalem, what's that from? It's the Good Samaritan. A certain man began in the city of God, and a certain man went down from the city of God, and that man fell. Who's the man that falls? Adam. Who's the man that be? Who's the man that overcomes? So a certain man goes up from Jericho. 
to restore all that are lost. That's where he begins. And in 2000, we had a solemn assembly. I didn't even watch it. Wasn't even paying attention. Had no clue. We shouted Hosanna as a people from stake centers for the first time in the history of the church. All over the world. All over the world. I missed it. Six months later, we had another solemn assembly. I missed it. Wasn't even paying attention. I'm 20 years late. It all started. It was so obvious. 2001, what happens? Oh, the 9-11. Towers come down just like in the northern kingdom of Israel in Isaiah 9, verse 10. What did the people say in the pride and stoutness of their hearts in Isaiah 9, 10? They rebelled against God and they said, no worries, we will rebuild these towers with hewn stone. Guess what Barack Obama and Tom Daschle literally read from when the towers came down? The Bible. They read that exact verse, uttering the ancient curse of Israel upon America in 2001. The towers fell and struck a sycamore tree that died at the chapel where George Washington swore his oath of office. They replanted it with a cedar, just like in Isaiah 9:10, and it withered and died. After that tower fell in Israel, God brought judgment <coughs> upon Israel for failure to repent 19 years later. 2001 plus 19. 2020. Now, so keep all this in mind, okay? We, 2000, we've got these amazing events going on. It's the beginning of a new millennium. <clears throat> President Hinckley actually says that. We're here at Palmyra, the beginning of this new millennium. But our millennium is year zero. So now let's go to the Book of Mormon. The most correct of any book on earth. We're going to go to 3rd Nephi. Chapter 4. Came to pass in the latter end of the 18th year of the new millennium. What year would that be for us? 17. 17. In the latter end of the 17th years, the robbers don't come to battle, even though they're prepared, but they sally forth to take possession of the land. What's happening, in the la what's happening in the latter end of 2017 in the modern northern kingdom of Israel? Donald Trump has taken office, and, they're trying to and the him. secret combinations around the world are going nuts. How many of you remember that moment where uh, Donald Trump is at the, what was the place? He's at Syria. Whirlpool, I think, yeah. where he says, i got to go away for a little while because people are trying to kill me. He said that. <laughs> had a campaign speech as president, and he went away to Camp David for a long time, and he openly uh, cited, guess who? Pharmaceutical companies, which is crazy because you go to Revelation chapter 18, it says, by, by their sorceries, all the nations of the earth were deceived. <laughs> After it talks about these Babylon falling in one day and dust going over people's heads and all the merchants in the sea lamenting over the fall of Babylon in one hour, which is a type and sign, 2001. So, um, God, why did I just lose my train of thought right before I said that? Sorry. Okay, anyway. Okay, so Trump comes to office and he, he cites the pharmaceutical companies. The word sorcery in Revelation 18, by, the, by their sorceries, all the nations of the earth were deceived. It's pharma, pharmakia. Pharmakia is pharmacopoeia. It means uh, medicinal dispensaries. That's what, and that's what he cited in that same, uh, anyway, I think it was that same year. Uh, either way, he comes to office. Now watch what happens in there. I'm going to go kind of fast to cover some of this, so I apologize if I'm talking really fast. Okay, 21st year, look what happens. There's a siege, and it's not a siege to do battle. It's a siege to cut the Nephites off from their privileges. Oh. That's in their 21st year. What would that be for us? 20. That's 20. Did we have a siege on the world economy that cut us off from our churches, our temples, our schools, and our privileges? Yes. 
Okay, now the leader of this band of Gadiant robbers does not actually lead the siege. He sends somebody else to do it. A guy named Zebnarihah, a front man. And so the front man is the one who gets tried and falls for the siege. Fauci, who the very next year is put on trial in front of Congress. Well, you could say, but he didn't die and get hung from a tree. But you got to go study Mosiah. Because once we lost the kings, what happened? Mosiah says, now that I've transferred this to you, we're responsible. you will bear the burdens of your votes. And therefore, the punishment of the king is now <coughs> yours. So Fauci doesn't get hung from a tree anymore. Guess who has to pay the price? We do. And our guy, just like their guy, got metaphorically hung from a tree in front of Congress, and nobody ever bothered to discover who was really behind it. And to this day, there's no accountability. You know what our death rate was for kids with COVID in 2020? Zero. Literally zero. And yet we, as parents, masked all of our children and I have a client whose kid was locked in a closet for two days because they contact traced him to another kid who had COVID. So they false imprisoned him under the law and locked him away for two days against his parents' will. Finally, his dad said, go up to the door and test it. Because they would take him to the closet, they'd send him in, and they'd lock the door when he went in. So he would hear them lock the door. And so he has a phone. He's like, Dad, they locked me in a closet. And his dad's like, what? So Dad says, this is the second day. Dad <clears throat> says, go over to the door. Test the door. Kid walks up. It unlatches. He says, go get out of there right now. Kid walks out of school, and the principal follows him in his truck and tells him he has to go back and get in the closet. So the sheriff's office shows up at their house the next day, watching their home to make sure their kid doesn't get on the school bus. It's insane. Zero accountability. This is Utah. Yeah, this is Utah. This is my client in Weber County. Sound like my granddaughter refused to wear a mask and we went to the store and they were like, put your mask on and she was only eight at the time and she just said, I can't. And they were like, why? Have you got a medical reason? She says, yes, I have RCS. And they were like, oh, okay. And then the lady says, well, what's RCS? And she goes, it's really common sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so watch, watch how this flows out. Okay. Now, pay it, this, is, this gets a little tricky, okay, because um, in the next chapter, these events, remember our legal conversation at the beginning about habeas corpus and dead people and living souls? Mm -hmm. Look at what Mormon says in 3 Nephi 5. Because of the siege, which doesn't end until... Their, 2000, uh, their 26th year, okay? The beginning of the 26th year, the siege ends, finally. Mormon says, there was not a living soul who did doubt in the least the words of the holy prophets. These events in the Book of Mormon were such that an, a, a living soul, and what's a living soul? Us. Um, no. No. You you have to become one. You have to have the breath of God breathed into you. Where do you get the breath of God infused into you? You're taught in the scriptures how to do it. It's the process of taking upon you the name of Christ until he breathes his spirit into you. Uh, can I tell you a little side story real quick? Yes. Anybody from Hawaii? What's the greeting in Hawaii? Aloha. Aloha ha is breath in Hawaiian just like it is in Hebrew. And when the Hawaiians greeted the uh, British, they would uh, go up and do the embrace with their brothers. And over the shoulder, they would whisper the breath of God into the ear of the brother. And the white guy didn't know how to whisper the breath of God over the shoulder. And so they called them, uh, 
without breath or without spirit. Aha ole, howly, which means without breath or without spirit because they didn't know the godly greeting of the embrace and the whispering of the word. Uh, so to become a living soul, you have to have that infused into you. You have to have the breath of God spoken into you. And if you're not a living soul, then this probably doesn't apply to you. But anybody who was, was expected by Mormon, if you really were a living soul, to understand that somebody's coming, that the Lord is on his way. And now that you know the Lord is on his way, Mormon was saying it, you know what to do. Now that you know the words of the holy prophets are true, go study them and you'll see everything else that's coming. So they knew because of these events, it was expedient that Christ had already come. Remember what Sister Nelson said? Yes. Yeah. What if I yeah. told you that, Christ that he'd already been, been here in several meetings? Now, they, the living souls forsake all their sins at this point, and they serve God with all diligence day and night. And they enter into a covenant that they would live in liberty, that they would murder no more. These are the secret combinations, guys. If you want to invite me back someday, we could have an entire conversation on what is a secret combination and how you're peddling them in your towns and through your schools. Yeah. You know what that says? I'll just give you a real quick preview. It says in the Book of Mormon that the secret combinations were administered to the people. Think about that one and ask yourself, how did they administer the secret combinations to you? Okay, so in the 20 and second year, now here's where it's tricky. He tells you what happens in the 22nd year. So if you're not careful with your English and your grammar here, you're going to confuse these four years. And you're only supposed to focus on three because he just described to you all the events leading up to the 22nd year. Which for us would be 21. And then he says... The 23rd, 24th, and 25th year passed away. And all he says is, great and marvelous things happened in those three years. That's it. Like, that's horrible. He's totally leaving his hand. Can't be rid of it. Come on, Mormon. What's the one thing that will cause every Book of Mormon prophet to zip right up like that? Great and marvelous work. And, and where do you find that at? End of the world. The Lord. And who writes about that? John. And what will no Nephite prophet talk about? Anything, about Anything. Anything having to do with John the Revelator. So what if, you know, just by chance, Mormon knew what he was doing. Joseph Smith was a really good guesser. <coughs> John talked about great and marvelous things. Well, we could find that out by doing a real quick search. Great and marvelous. Narrow it down to the scriptures. Oh, look at that. The first one up. Oh, Revelation chapter 15. And in it, oh, well, there you go. Great and marvelous stuff. And guess who John also talks about in the next chapter, which is also going to deal with these great and marvelous things? Living souls, just like Mormon does. That's not an accident. So does this happen to be... Why President Nelson has just said, expect miracles, like that's the next thing mm -hmm. that we're supposed to be looking forward to, miracles. Remember what he said about how the greatest ones would start to happen? Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that. From now. Um, yeah. But he, well, let me tell you one other thing he also said is we now live in the day in which nothing will be withheld. So think about what that offers to you in your life. Nothing will be withheld. Okay. Revelation 15, I saw a sign in heaven, great and marvelous, the seven last plagues. Not so great and marvelous. <laughs> He's pulling a fast one on us. And the seven last plagues begin in Revelation chapter 16, and the first one is a noisome and grievous sore. Now, Webster 
who wrote the 1828 dictionary claimed that God inspired him to write it. And what he did is he took scripture, just like in Moses 6, the same priesthood which was in the beginning shall be in the end, and he tried to correct our language with scriptural definitions of American and English words. So when Webster talks about a sore, I'm not going to take you there, so it'll take time. Sore says Isaiah. Sore equals an affliction. So now change the word. The first vial, which Mormon seems to point us to as the first in the series of great and marvelous things, is an affliction that is noisome. Now you go to Webster's 1828 dictionary, look up noisome. And he says it's a, it's a noise created from something like an effluvia. <laughs> What's an effluvia? A flu. A flu. The first vial is a flu-like affliction. That's the first one. Now the second vial is a vial that when it is poured upon the sea. Anybody ever heard of maritime law? It's a different kind of law than land law. And there's another law besides maritime law. Where's admiralty? In our courts today. Yeah, so, okay, but that's combo of maritime. There's the law of the air, which we don't ever even talk about these days. But God gives to Adam dominion over what? The earth, the sea, and the air, the heavens. So this second vial affects anyone of the sea. Okay, you got to get John's symbolism. And when it hits the sea, who dies? Only the living souls. And this is not an earthly death. This is a water death. Therefore, a living soul who has gone through the water and doesn't have personal revelation to do the things they do dies as a living soul. A spiritual death. President Nelson said, if you do not get personal revelation, you will not survive spiritually. spiritually. This is the living soul's death. Because Mormon says, look, living souls wake up and repent and come to the Lord completely and believe the Lord and his holy prophets completely. And John is saying, if you don't, it's over. Okay, And these, these vials progressively start to kill physically and spiritually. So Mormon asks us to look over there and then we come back. And we ask ourselves in 2022, which is the only year we have so far, have great and marvelous things happened this year? Roe v. Wade was overturned. The Queen of England died. I could spend an hour on why that matters and why Prince Charles. Uh, go watch his G20 summit talk. Oh, yeah where he announces that the leaders of the world will now take a warlike footing against people who will not comply with their environmental laws. And I, I'm, I'm not joking. He says, we will raise an army and trillions of dollars to bring them into compliance. And he says, we will put those trillions of dollars at, quote, his disposal, end quote. He doesn't say Prince Charles. Who's he? He doesn't say sure. who that is. Um, we also have the BRICS summit in June of 2022. BRICS is the combination of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They gather together in 2022, and they declare that they will now create a world reserve currency. When you do that, what does America do? We kill you. We go to war against you. So you can't do that to Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So what do you do? You go into a Cold War like we did in the 80s against Russia. The second Cold War has started. If you lived in the 80s, what was the Cold War in the 80s a precursor to? Everybody was talking about it. World War III. World War III. 
Here we are again in a political and economic World War III that started in June of 2022. Again, you can go, you can go learn about the BRICS summit right online. Uh, we had, we've had a recession in 2022. Now, minus seven years from 2022. 15. What happened in 15? Micro recession and the destruction of the family under American law when we approved any marriage. Go back seven years from 15. Uh, 2008. 08. Go back seven years from 08. 9-11. And now in October of 2001, President Hinckley gets up in front of the entire church and says, I do not think the all-consuming calamity prophesied by the ancient prophets is here. At least I hope not. What's the implication there? And it will happen. It will come. But I don't think it's now. And then he says, I cannot help but think of the lesson of Pharaoh of the fat and the lean kind, which is on how many year cycle? Seven. Seven. And then he's, there's two other things in there, the withered stocks and the good stocks. How many years is that? 28 years. 2001 plus seven, 15. Sorry, 2001 plus seven, eight. 2008, 15. 15, 22, 22 plus seven, 29. That's incredible. Because President Hinckley basically predicted the Great Reset being talked about by the World Economic Forum as of 2020, which will result in what? The loss of all property, the nationalization of everything. <coughs> Starting in the year that is the 100 year anniversary of the collapse of the American and British stock markets that led to the Great Depression, and it will fall on the same Jewish holiday in 2029 that it did in 1929. That's President Hinckley's prophecy. Guess what happens in the parable of the lean kind at the end? Israel is driven out and into Egypt, and then what happens to Egypt? It's amazing. It literally says in the Bible, the money failed. What's the World Economic Forum saying is going to happen in 1929 or 2000? You will own nothing and be happy. They're literally telling us that the money will fail in 2029. They've been saying it for two years since COVID. All that's 2022. Ukraine is happening. Um, yeah. All these are. I'll explain that. Um, okay, so. So it's interesting, right? The Book of Mormon, this thing's the most correct of any book on earth, lines up with all these archetypes in the very same year and seems to set us on a year-by-year -year playbook, makes us right. which almost seems too good to be true. It's kind of like me saying, hey, the, did you know that the biggest news in 2020 was not COVID? You know what it was? I'm not joking. The United States government admitted that there are aliens. In 2020. Yeah, yeah. And everybody's like, ah, COVID. They're all no, they, they just admitted there's UFOs. Ah, yeah, COVID's here. <laughs> so I could say this all day long. Hey, by the way, the Book of Mormon gives you a year-by-year -year playbook, and you know exactly what to do. And people are like, ah, yeah, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> it's there if you want it. <laughs> so watch what happens now. 20 and 60 year, the siege ends. That's and the biggest 20. challenge faces the Nephites now. Beyond any disease, beyond any famine, the siege stops and they're given prosperity again. Mm -hmm. The thing that kills all Mormons, the love of prosperity. Right? And so once the siege ends, they all go back to Egypt, ends, they all go back, ends, they all go back to normal. And they even kind of reform their laws according to equity and justice, it says. Now look at verse 14. So in the, I should probably show you this. In the 20 and 9th year, 28, there began to be disputings, boastings, all those lawyers back again, and riches, ranks, poverty, Pride, persecution, affliction. So they go back to normal in 26, 27, and by 28, they're already backsliding 
right into the same old problems. And then in the 30th year, there became a great inequality in the land such that what happened to the church? It broke up. The church was broken up. In the year, same year as the Great Reset. When they say they're going to take everything. And the church is a 501c3, and we already have a law in the nation of America, Johnson v. McIntosh, that says the church doesn't own anything. Ultimate title rests with the United States government. So in 2029, there's a 501c3, there's a corporation, and there are keys. And they're going to take everything but the keys. keys. What's going to happen to your testimony? You're going to think that they... You know now. You can't claim ignorance now. You know. So when it happens, be faithful and shore up others. And testify to them what you know. And save testimonies and prepare them. And then, guess what they do? Um, what time is it? 29. Okay, if, <laughs> no, nobody ahead. ever takes me up on this, and I don't blame you because this gets exhausting. I understand it. If you remind me, and you stay, and we can stay, ask me about the secret combinations that lead up to this thing that I'm going to show you here in a sec. So all these things will be taken from the church. What about the temples? Um, very simple, okay? This is my theory, all right? If you know what's coming as a church, what would you do with your money? And you have lots of it. Get rid of it. What build would you spend as many it temples as you can. I'd build as many temples as I could. And then when the government shut everything down, what would I do? I'd close them. Just like I did in 2020. And they'll take them. And if you look at the history of the church, we don't ever care. We're like, okay, have it. I mean, we'll defend it as long as we can, but once ultimately we're going to lose it, we're okay. Why? Because the kingdom of God. We'll build another one. Yeah. We're faithful. <laughs> you can take whatever you want. We'll, we'll even clean it out and rededicate it after you bastards get done with it. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. That's how we are, right? So they'll close. And I, I'll show you that. Um, remind me after I finish this, to, and I'll take you to Isaiah 3 which continues the prophecy of Isaiah 2, which shows the temple's closed. Which, again, and, if you don't have your testimony and you don't have personal revelation, when that happens, you might falter. You, well, would, you might question everything if you see that and you haven't... Mormons aren't supposed to be socialists, <laughs> right? And so when, when people take stuff by force, we don't go with it, but we also don't falter because we recognize what socialism is and... Mm -hmm. We've been dealing with this for since the church. Yeah. That begs a wheat and a tears conversation, but I can't do it. Let's finish this. Okay. <laughs> now, so, they did, now look at this. This is really important. Because the when President Hinckley says, I cannot help but think of the lesson to Pharaoh. We are Pharaoh. We don't have pharaohs today. We are the ones who are pharaoh. That's the Mosiah lesson with King Noah and Abinadi and the granting of the Nephite Republic in the Book of Mormon. So we're pharaoh. So the lesson is, and it's stated twice in Genesis, God will show to pharaoh all that he will do. So 2020 showed us the pattern of everything that's going to happen. It starts with a disease and a pandemic. The loss of all liberty. And then what? We've got our years wrong. I'll show you in the Book of Mormon that the year truly begins in spring. So if you track that way, it begins with COVID in spring. And it ends with a stolen election by fraud. And the surrounding of every single state capitol building by U.S. forces. Do you know that happened? Every capital in America was surrounded by U.S. troops in the latter part of the of 2020 which really if you follow a hebrew calendar continues on into april okay so the lesson is god will show unto pharaoh that which he's about to do and why does god do that because for this reason if he doesn't show his people and give them a chance to see 
once they slide back into the iniquity, he can't rightfully destroy them. But once he shows you and gives you back your liberty, and then you slide back in, you're not sinning ignorantly, and now God is justified in destroying you. So in, in tw the 26th year, they all go back to normal. That'd be our 25. Guess what happens in 2024? That second sign, the solar eclipse in April right. on a Jewish holiday. <clears throat> so by this time, the Lord says, all right, that's it. You went right back like a dog to your vomit. It's over. <laughs> and I love this one right here. There was no lawyer nor judge that could have power to condemn anyone to death. So who wants to kill everybody? Lawyers and judges. <laughs> and um, look at what they do. And the Book of Mormon mentions three types of people, lawyers, judges, and high priests. Remember Caiaphas? Remember the moment where Caiaphas says, oh, I get it now. We're still going to kill him. And that's this moment right here in the Book of Mormon. They enter into a covenant, one with another, yea, even into that covenant which was given by them of old, which covenant was given and administered by the devil to combine against all righteousness. This is the fullness of the satanic covenant. If the fullness of the satanic covenant is opening up at this time, guess what else is happening? <clears throat> fullness of the gospel. What's President Nelson been saying? It's coming. Get ready. And God's going to pour out power and miracles like you've never seen before. Why? Because the opposite's also coming. So what happens is in the same year that the church is broken apart, the 30th year, they destroy the government of the land. And for three and a half years approximately, the whole nation goes into anarchy. And the prophets of God are on the lamb. So where's Nephi from? The land of Nephi's nativity is Zarahemla. So why does Nephi show up in a place called Bountiful after being on the lamb for three years? Because God told him to. He was lucky. No evidence. He's lucky. That's, that's all it is. There's, there's no evidence of why. The Book of Mormon doesn't tell you. But Mormon tells you. And Alma tells you. Hey, watch what happens. you got to go back a little bit. Mormon will occasionally interrupt the narrative of the Book of Mormon to editorialize. When he does, pay attention. Remember when he says there's not a living soul that didn't repent? Here's what he says at the end of that chapter. It's kind of odd when you read it without realizing why. Which chapter are you in? Three, five. Third Nephi 5. <clears throat> I am Mormon, he says. And my first thought was like, yeah, <laughs> we know that. Like, you got the name. Do you need, like, does Mormon need some attention here? <laughs> it, really think about that. Why would you tell me your name? He's giving you an ancestry. I'm Mormon. I am a descendant of Lehi. And I want you to know that because <clears throat> Lehi brought my forefather out of Jerusalem. And Lehi was what in the church? That was Jeremiah. He was a member. He was a random dad who looked like a serial killer. Right? If I showed up to your ward for a couple years and you got to know me and I was like, hey, uh, don't tell anybody Jesus is coming. So my family and I are going up into the mountains. You'd be like, oh, Okay. And then I'm, I like take off. And you're like, he did it. <laughs> Phil Pot left. <laughs> and, and before Phil Pot left, he said Salt Lake City was going to be destroyed. Made all his kids go with him. It's 10 years later. Phil Pot's gone. Salt Lake City's still around. And you're like, I remember that dude talking about building a ship. In our day, it'd be like a spaceship. Uh, Morgan said he's going to build a spaceship. Go to Kolob. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure he killed his entire family out of the woods. <laughs> and you never see Lehi again. He's just gone. Because he's a rando. You know, he's just this dude. Jeremiah's still around. If anybody was going to leave, surely Jeremiah would have told us. Look at what Mormon says. No one knew it. Save who? 
save himself. Only the fathers who were let out. Nobody else knew. So here's Mormon going, man, I am so grateful to be a descendant of Lehi. Now watch what he says next. Surely shall he again bring a remnant of the seed of Joseph to the knowledge of the Lord their God. And gather those who are scattered. That's his message to us. Right before the entire nation falls apart. Now it gets even better. Go all the way back into Alma. All you got to do, if you can't remember where to go, just search general. Alma was the founder of the church when the government was reorganized. Why would they have to found a church when the government's reorganized? It's got new laws. So what does the church become once Alma reorganizes it? It became general throughout the land. <coughs> General in Webster's 1828 dictionary basically means common or public, like a corporation or a 501c3. And because of this moment, at the founding of the church in the Book of Mormon, ours is under Joseph Smith, for some reason, whatever Alma is teaching, it causes people to inquire where the Son of God will come to the Nephites? And the answer to that question is bountiful. But Mormon doesn't record it because it is not to be had in that way. Just like 3rd Nephi doesn't tell you how these people wound up in bountiful. Now there's a temptation here. I want to talk about this in a second because you don't want to go wrong by this. They know where to be, but people don't know when to go and how to go because they're not in a state of personal revelation like their prophet told them to be. Our founder told us where Christ would appear, which is where? Adam on Diamond. But none of us in this room have keys to organize to go to Adam on Diamond. You could go as an individual with your family, but if I stood up and said, hey, I'm organizing a camp of Israel to go to Zion, you could be like, nah, apostate, and you'd be right, because I don't have those keys. I don't have keys to build the new Jerusalem. Those are apostolic keys. So the only thing you can do is get in a state of personal revelation so you know where to be and when to be there. And I would say to you, in my belief, that if you do that properly, you will find your place. You will find yourself in a place where there will be an apostle. And you should offer your service to that apostle as Ezekiel and Jeremiah tell you to do. Right? They, you ever heard of the great company that shall return? I should probably show you this real quick. Because this is really relevant to some revelation we just got from our prophet. Let's go scriptures, Old Testament. All right. How many of you remember President Nelson standing up in front of the church and saying, I had a vivid dream? In that dream, there was a path. A woman who appears to have gotten off the path and wants to know how to get back on, and a large group of people. Okay, who is the woman in scripture? The church. 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 Who's the large group of people? Oh. Look at Jeremiah. <clears throat> there shall be a day that the watchman upon Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise and let us go to Zion. Now, most people think that's a prophet or an apostle. And sure, they are, but that's not what Jeremiah and Ezekiel are talking about. And to understand that, you have to understand Nephite doctrine in the Book of Mormon. 
If you can finish this sentence too, it was the custom of the Nephites in times of righteousness to appoint captains who had the gift of prophecy and revelation. But when they weren't righteous, they didn't appoint people. How did God tell Israel to organize itself in the patriarchal fashion? By tens. We don't do it. We don't even have a clue what that is. You study the concept of tens, and in ancient Israel, fathers who were righteous and had the gift of spirit, uh, prophecy and revelation were banding together to protect their families. They were being political. But they weren't waiting for the government to tell them how to do it. In the Book of Mormon, it's the same. Jeremiah and Ezekiel see it the same way. Guess how Ezekiel says you select your watchmen? He says you take them from among your coasts. And that in Hebrew means from among your people. So how do you get a watchman? <coughs> you pick them. Because you're organizing the way God commanded Israel to organize. So the watchmen are going to say, hey, it's time to go. And the Lord is going to respond to them in the fashion of Isaiah. Yeah, sing with gladness. This is the Isaiah song as they go where? To the feast of fat things, to Adam on Diamond. And look who they meet as they're in this gift of prophecy and revelation as a united people, right? As righteous fathers and mothers who have the gift of, of personal revelation. The Lord says, I'll bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast. There it is again. Ezekiel used that same term to tell you how to select a watchman. So he'll gather them from among the people and he'll bring them to who? To the woman. To the woman With who child. travails. That's Revelation chapter 12. The woman who travails is the church. So who brings the church? All the righteous men and women who prepared. We've got it the other way around. We have all these people saying, I saw this dream of, of white tent cities. Like, that's called a concentration camp. <laughs> <laughs> the church doesn't take care of you. You're supposed to protect the church. We men are supposed to create an environment of safety for the woman, the church. And we are supposed to prepare ourselves to take her. And once we do... Then you go to DNC 136, which is Brigham Young's only revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, which is the organization of the camps of Israel, headed up by the Council of Fifty, organized in 1844 as the Kingdom of God, which Brigham Young gave the church over into the hands of the Kingdom of God, and the Kingdom brought the church west. We will go back the same way we came out. But if you aren't ready for that... <clears throat> And everything falls apart, and you start searching the scriptures. Well, where do I go? When do I go? Not going to tell you. And then all of a sudden, all this horrible destruction happens in one day. That's where you learn the actual calendar of the Nephites. It says there's this great storm on the fourth day of the first month. When did Christ die? Fourth April. April. So April's the first month? Yes. Yeah, according to... It makes sense, right? Spring is the beginning of life. So you go there and you think, well, God, what do I do? You know, how do I get ready for these kinds of things? Well, one, you know, I, I could be completely wrong. And even if I was, guess what? We're the Lord's people. We're supposed to live every day literally like he's coming. That's our job. That was our one job. It wasn't to get rich. It wasn't to get successful. It was to raise kids who watched for the Lord and remained always diligent and stood as a witness at all times and in all places. That's who we are. So, <coughs> third Nephi, chapter six. Everything falls apart in that 29th year. But you're given an entire preview, right? And Mormon even mentions to you this guy named Lehi. And this is a little bit of trivia, which kind of combines with this. But do you remember what year the Ark of the Covenant disappeared from Israel? Or from Jerusalem? Five. About 585 B.C. When did Lehi leave? 600. About 600 B.C. 
What did Nephi steal? The brass plates. Where do you keep the brass plates? In the ark. In the ark of the covenant. You can't beat Israel if they have the ark. Somebody stole the ark. And he needed somebody to help him carry it. And he had to be a Levite. And that Levite would follow him because this one guy could reach into the ark and not get zapped. Dead. Where do you find the Ark of the Covenant in ancient Israel? In the treasury. Who's the captain of the treasury? Laban. <laughs> okay, so... Zoran. Um, all right, now, uh, Jerusalem is destroyed how many years after Lehi leaves? Thirteen. 2029, or in the 30th year, the church is broken apart. 28, 27, 26, did I get that right? 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19. Did I do 15 years? Sorry, you never do math in public. That was 10 years. 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. All right, so if you're if you're not awake by 2016 just start ticking off the years and that's how late you are and that's what hit me in 2020 and i was like oh crap i'm like three years four years behind and i i mean i i was like i gotta get i gotta get ready and i i kid you not i i kind of went into a frenzy i got scared and I read a verse in the Doctrine and Covenants where the, sword, the Lord says, um, let your flight not be in haste. And I went, oh, okay. Um, and I realized, you know, the Lord doesn't work by fear. And I, I realized a lot of what I say, right? Because what happens to the ancient kingdom of Judah or Yehuda? Those who don't leave when they're supposed to or who don't have a promise of the Lord upon their home or the place that they are, Zedekiah's kids get killed in front of his face. Mm -hmm. And the scriptures don't ever talk about men fleeing to Zion. They talk about women, kids, lame, blind, no men. Because the men are supposed to prepare. So... I, I was kind of getting a little freaked out, and I I remember thinking, uh, I came across a verse, I think in 2 Nephi, where the Lord makes a covenant that he will bring down the secret works of darkness in the flesh. That means not in the next life, that means here. There is an ancient covenant that we all have as Israel, that God will bring them down, and that's what he's doing. So to be afraid of the fulfillment of that covenant is not <clears throat> rational. Rather, you should see that fulfillment taking place all around you and say, thank goodness he's finally doing it. And now get yourself ready for what's ahead. The greatest thing you could ever imagine, the arrival of the Lord at Adam on Diamond. And what, what better time is there to live? All right, um, I think I'll cease and turn the time over to you guys for questions if you want them. And uh, you're the host, so you tell us when we got to get out of here. We don't care if you want to stay on That's the host right there. <laughs> thank you for having this, by the way. And uh, Thorups and Holbrooks, thank you for helping. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> what was the scripture? Was it in Isaiah? That re oh, you referenced. Oh, yeah. uh, um, okay. President Nelson. Watch. Um, yeah. Watch how this unfolds. If you read Isaiah, and the Lord commands us to read Isaiah in Third Nephi, which is post uh, atonement. Which means he's not talking to the past. He's talking to us. Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. 
established in the top of the mountains. And here's the missionaries in verse 4. The missionaries go out and judge the nations, rebuke people, and try to convince people to not make war, but to beat their swords into plowshares. And the house of Jacob is at first inviting people to walk in the light of the Lord. And then all of a sudden, very rapid transition from being in good status with the Lord to falling out of good status with the Lord in verse 6. Because we started to replenish ourselves from the East. You took $105 billion from Washington, D.C. instead of relying upon me. My prophet told you all to fast and pray and to get personal revelation. Instead, you laundered $100 billion through your state for a secret combination. And you shut down your churches and your temples and you didn't protect the church. And then when the prophet got vaccinated and wore a mask, you blamed him. Because you imposed this satanic government on him. And his job as the leader of the church is to protect the church and to obey the laws of the land. The Lord tells him that, but not us. We go to the temple and we make a covenant to obey the Lord only. And to provide a safe haven for the church, and we didn't do it. We turned ourselves over to soothsayers. Soothsayer is a person who tries to predict the future based upon non-Christian or non-godly ways. Climate change. Hey, if we don't do what I say, the world's going to be destroyed, not by God, but by climate change. So do what we say and let us tax you and have power. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say, our land, I'm going to change the language. I'm going to liken this unto us. Our land is full of silver and gold. Our land is full of cars and airplanes and buses. Our land is full of idols, right? You don't send your kids to school to learn about Christ. You send your kids to school to learn how to make money. And then your kid goes to school and wants to be like Ronaldo or nasty, sick rock stars and actors who worship the devil. And then you want your kid to date the most popular person and go to all the dances and be liked by everybody. Right? That's, that's us. That's our idolatry. Proms and satanic holidays. I mean, I don't want to get into that stuff. But. So because of that, the Lord says, hey, enter into the rock. Hide. The Lord starts to imply that an earthquake is coming. Oh, now i got to show you something else. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so, so go into the holes of the rocks. Cast your idols away. How do you get ragged rocks down here and valleys up here? By an earthquake. And who knows the scripture? Upon my house it shall begin. shall begin. And from my house it shall go forth. So was there an earthquake recently? Yes. And did that earthquake strike the Lord's house? Yes. And did it knock a trumpet out of the angel's hand? Yes. And that trumpet means what? It's a symbol of a proclamation of the restoration of the gospel to all the world. And right after that trumpet falls out of the hands of Moroni, President Nelson metaphorically picks it up goes to the sacred grove in a solemn assembly and blows that trumpet to all the world in an official proclamation from the church on the restoration of the gospel from the sacred grove. But that's a coincidence. <laughs> I could take you to Jeremiah where it tells you what to do next. In Jeremiah chapter 4, get out, it says. So then in chapter 3, okay, wait, i, I got to show you that thing. I said I was going to show you. Which, which prophets? You asked a question. Which one? Who's gone on? Okay. There, I got like 500 slides. It's horrible. Okay, there's the, uh, there's the day of the earthquake. It happened literally on the day before the spring solstice, which is the day of rebirth. This is a government infographic on the Salt Lake City earthquake. And just to give you some context, the University of Utah underplayed this in their ge uh, geology department, and so did the USGS. They said, oh, we've had earthquakes like this. No, it was the fourth largest earthquake in the history of Utah. They compared it to the Bluffdale earthquake, which had 200 seismic events or tremors in two months after the Bluffdale quake. The Salt Lake quake had two thousand trimmers in two weeks and these are those trimmers emanating from the house of the lord 
From my house it shall go forth. Upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth. The Salt Lake earthquake literally shook the entire promised land. As a result, we called a solemn assembly where President Nelson blew that trumpet. In Jeremiah 4, now everybody knows the scripture, Jeremiah, before thou wast born, I knew thee. I ordained thee as a prophet to nations. And nations in Hebrew is? Gentiles. Gentiles. Go ye. I ordained you a prophet to the Gentiles. Jeremiah's like the consummate Judean prophet. But God says he foreordained him to be a prophet to us. So now we read this and liken it unto ourselves. Declare in modern Yehuda and in Salt Lake City, blow the trumpet that President Nelson blew after he picked it up. Assemble yourselves, capital A. That's how it is in the King James Version. Capital A is a solemn assembly, which President Nelson called. And then six months later, he says to the women of the church, Come on, places of safety. Oh, places of safety. create defense cities, physically and spiritually, starting with your home. Set up your standard towards where? Where's that? Doctrine of Covenants. Zion is the city. Everything else is a state. Zion is the queen. Salt Lake City is a daughter. Set your standard to Zion. Retire, stay not. Now what's so there's the default. Get out is the scriptural default. Now people say, well, I, I don't want to get out. I'm not supposed to get out. Oh, I, I, I'm okay with that. Men, we are covenant men. We've been to the temple. We make covenants and we keep them. So we, if we don't want to get out, then we go get a promise in our covenant with the Lord to protect our families. And if you don't have that, your family is not safe. And it is your duty as a man and a father to bring that promise upon your home. And if you can't do that, then do what the prophet tells you to do, if nothing else. So why? Why do we do this? Because the destroyer, our destroyer, is on the way. And who's the destroyer of the Gentiles? The Red Ram. The Assyrian. <laughs> And the Assyrian is also the conqueror in the ancient scriptures of the northern kingdom of Israel. Is and guess American. what triggers the destruction of Israel? The invasion of Damascus by the king of Assyria. Now here's Syria. Here's Damascus. Okay. Can you think of a country in our day that is just to the southwest of the modern progeny of the ancient Assyrians? See, in ancient Israel, Israel's over here, Damascus is here, Assyria's here, and Assyria's got this problem up north with a group of people called the Scythians. Oh. Scythians are barbaric, and they're always invading their lands, so the Assyrian king marries his daughter, the Scythian king. And then he invades Israel and conquers it, and then he gets destroyed by the Babylonians, so where's the Assyrian royalty now? Scythia, which becomes Russia, which just invaded like ancient Assyria did, a little country to its south and west called Damascus. And in the ancient war, the king of Assyria went and destroyed the city of the Damascus king. When Russia invaded the Ukraine, Putin targeted Zelensky's hometown and bombed the crud out of it. And it has no strategic significance whatsoever, just to teach Zelensky a lesson. That was the sign to ancient Israel that they were next so the destroyer of the Gentiles again I could be wrong okay could just be a type and sign but don't ignore those all right so we go back to Isaiah and the Lord's going to take away from Salt Lake City and from Utah the stay in the staff the whole stay of bread the whole stay of water drought and famine right now we're in one of the biggest droughts we've had it's fake by the way it's not real. Uh, it's only the man-made sources of water that are drying up. If That's you have right. a natural water source, my guess is you have a lot of water. And so, and, but remember what the Lord promises. Spring, you know, spring forth water for his people and the 
desert will blossom as the rose, all these wonderful promises to us. Okay, uh, Utah used to have a caucus system, and that caucus system was created by the Council of 50, the kingdom of God on earth, where they organized themselves in neighborhoods with captains, and the people were expected to do so in the spirit of prophecy and revelation. We eliminated that recently, so Isaiah sees that. Hey, you eliminated your caucus system, your, your captain system, and you have children ruling over you. That's your state legislature. I know I was there. I was an idiot, too. <laughs> and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another. He's seen COVID, being oppressed by your own neighbors. Why aren't you wearing a mask? Why are you wearing a mask? Did you give that? Did you not? You know, what are you doing at church without a mask? What are you doing at church with a mask? It's a bickering at church. Divisive. And then he says, you know, Jerusalem, Salt Lake City's ruined. Utah's fallen. Why? Because the people, not the church, this is not the church's fault. It was our job to sustain liberty so that the church could always exist in a state of liberty. And, and he says, look, the shoe of your face, your countenance, the shoe of your countenance witnesses against you. You won't show your face, but you will show what? Who you are. You'll parade your sins as Sodom. Go to Salt Lake City in June, Pride Month, where there's a gay parade that, you know, Eric Mutzos is, got fired because he wouldn't ride in it as a police officer. So we'll parade our sins all over the state of Utah, but we won't show you our face. That's fulfilled in 2020. He even sees who the mayors are over Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City. Women rule over you. I don't care if a woman is in office. I don't think this is a derogatory. I think Isaiah is just saying, hey, this is going to happen in a day when women are ruling over you. Mayor of Salt Lake County is a woman. Mayor of Salt Lake City is a woman. Again, these could be coincidences, right? Now, here's where the temple imagery comes in. And we got to remember that Zion is the city, Zion is the place, and Zion is the queen, Zion is the bride, and her daughters are princesses or stakes. So the, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion. What is a daughter? The stakes and cities. It should, and, well, let me just stop there. What's wrong with them? They're prideful. So the Lord's going to smite them. And in that day, the Lord's going to take away, now notice the play on the metaphor here. He's going to take away your Babylonian accoutrements. You should love the adornments of the temple, but instead you have adorned yourselves with the things of Babylon. So he's going to take those away. And the, the changeable suits of apparel, and instead of a sweet smell, there shall be stink. Now where is the sweet smell coming from in ancient Israel? It's the incense that burns at the temple. And if the incense is not burning, it means the temple is closed. And so instead, there's a stink rather than the sweet of the temple. And instead of having a girdle and well-set hair and a stomacher, this is the temple clothing. I'm going to give you the opposite. You wanted the opposite? I'm going to give it to you. You wanted to shut down your churches and temples? Fine. I'll give you what you're asking for. Thy men shall fall by the sword and thy mighty in, not the wars, in the war that comes upon Judah according to ancient prophecy. And Judah is right here. Her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man. Joseph Smith said this verse belonged in chapter 3. I'm not going to get into the topic of polygamy tonight. I will give you an alternative. Go study the other one on your own. Seven women shall take hold of one man, but I think if I remember the, what was the question that led to this? I'm trying to remember it exactly. <laughs> I was asking who the prophet was in Isaiah, or what verse it was. <laughs> okay, anyway, <laughs> somebody <laughs> asked a question about, okay, well, so um, the Lord doesn't save the men. Pleiades is also the seven sisters. So there's an entire parable going on here that goes beyond just individual women, the church is a woman, and the calendar of God in the sky, which in Hebrew was the Maseroth, not the Zodiac, that's witchcraft, that's Greek crap. The Maseroth is the thing that God talks about in the scriptures, and the Maseroth are the constellations. 
So when you want to understand what tribe you're from, God doesn't reward people for being born to certain families. He doesn't care what your blood is. He doesn't care what color you are. He doesn't care how rich you are. He's not a respecter of persons. So when he puts you in a tribe, he expects you to discern the duties of the tribe and do them. And to understand those duties, once we understand them, we can then look up into the heavens as a second witness to the scriptures and know our place and the order of things by the outlay of God's stars as signs and appointed times. So that's what he's hinting at. He says, packing everything into this one verse. All a sign, the status of women, the status of men, the status of families, all right here. And Joseph Smith said this should be in Isaiah chapter 2, or 3. Because what you get is Isaiah gives you the vision of the fall of modern Utah and what happens to modern Utah. And so now, so you can know how to behave, right, and how to plan. All right. Sorry. I was like vomiting a book. My one question. And what do you think that will look like for modern youth? Okay, so um, I, I'm going to, this real quick, because this is the parable of the eagle. And the parable of the eagle begins in Deuteronomy. And if you go study Moses, Moses prophesies of the founding of America in Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. And then he says, someday in the future, the latter days... <clears throat> You people will take hold of this and restore the covenant with God, and he will return to you. So you think about that. When was the covenant restored with God? 1620, the Mayflower Compact. God says, if you do that first, then I will come to you. 200 years later, 1620 to 1820, God comes back to a young boy in a grove and restores the gospel. And then Moses says, look, if you don't keep these things, you know, you'll get America, you'll, you'll get all the blessings. God will set you above all nations. He'll make you the people. And then when you fail, he will bring all the curses upon you. And then Moses says, he will bring a nation from afar that flies like an eagle and does not speak your language. And they will attack you in all your gates and destroy you. That's how it happens. But you look at, again, go to the Book of Mormon, right? The Book of Mormon, how fast does the destruction come? Like that. Literally one year. One year, the Nephites are plunged into absolute civil war and anarchy. And it lasts for three years. Okay, so, so just, you know, take that lesson. I could walk you through Jacob. How Jacob tells us that 3 Nephi chapter 8 is really us. So... When, Nephi, when Jacob wants to tell the Israelites about their, or, sorry, when Jacob wants to tell the Nephites about their destruction, he says, I'm going to tell you about the Gentiles' destruction. Now think about that for a second. <clears throat> he says, the Gentiles will be destroyed by fire, tempest, earthquakes, lightnings, and the sword. Why would he do that? This is Jacob, Nephi's brother. Just tell him, hey, uh, uh, by the way, you guys are going to be destroyed in 3 Nephi chapter 8. So I'm going to prophesy of 3 Nephi chapter 8. Instead, he says, now I'm going to take a better example. One that's worse. The Gentiles. So 3 Nephi chapter 8 becomes what? A type and sign of our destruction. Because Jacob's describing our destruction, not theirs. So just add all those things together, right? And what we Latter-day Saints have become is we've become very complacent. We're like Laman and Lemuel. Nobody can destroy America. America can't fall in a day. What other place is like unto this great state and this great nation? And just like the Nephites, like that. Three and a half years of anarchy, and then uh, natural destruction. So you have political, economic, civil war, three years, catastrophic, uh, geological destruction and natural destruction. And what happens in that time, right, the Lord makes promises to Israel. He says, look, if, you, if you'll get with me, I'll bounce you through that thing. You'll be the only safe people on the face of the earth. I'll tell you where to be, when to be at all times, and you'll be fine. So I would 
I'm planning for the worst. <laughs> Morgan, you, you asked us to remind you about the, the secret combinations that led up to that. <clears throat> okay, I, I'm not offended if you leave. Feel free to just go. I, I realize that I'm painstakingly long-winded. So, if you stay for this, you'll be here. If you stay for this, can I, can I nice catch. Okay, I'll tell you what, I, I kind of forget to say this to people. If you will, if you'll gather 10 families, okay, because I don't want to talk to a bunch of other men's wives, okay, and if you don't say that, you go somewhere and it's like 10 women because they're the only ones that care. And I'm not in the business of meeting with other people's wives. So get 10 families, right? Couples, sons, daughters, which means approximately 20 people. And I'll go anywhere you want. I, have, I don't charge. I don't sell. You tell me where to be and we'll schedule and I'll be there. But you'll want my number for that. And I'm really, I'm a real procrastinator. So... Just know I'm a, I'm a weak man. You might have to send me five text messages. 801-891-4499. Um, what's that? Number one more time. 801-891-4499. Um, okay. This is actually one of my favorite things to talk about because as you can see and I'm going to take this off some hot um, as no I know I'm sorry that's my fault I, I'm not okay so a lot of this um, I, I really do enjoy this but it is also a little painstaking at times so when I get to talk about something that is fun I love it and I love a real exploration of secret combinations because to me it's it just opens up a whole new world in the scriptures so you know take this with a grain of salt okay um, first of all secret combinations are not what you think they are local right? they are what you would call good people who you like voting through degrees of separation to steal from and kill other people. That's what you do at the voting booth. We've all done it, we're all guilty. Okay, because if, if I, um, right now we force each other to pay for school. You have to pay or you will go to jail. And if they didn't do that, if they didn't threaten to imprison you and kill you if you wouldn't go to prison, we wouldn't pay, right? So. In order to get people to do that to each other, you have to indoctrinate them over long periods of time. And that's why the devil created public schools, right? The great and abominable churches of the devil that are on every corner in Utah. Amen. No offense to teachers, right? I love you. I, I'm not why, picking why on you. Why do you think we're still in and we're trying to make a difference? My, ki my kids are in. So I'm a hypocrite. I, I get why we go. There's nothing else to do. Um, I actually feel for the teachers who can't teach the truth or they get fired. And they need it to make a living, right? That's Revelation chapter 13. Uh, so, so secret combinations are very local. And the test that I took to get out was the test of Lot. Could I find 10 men in my community who did not ever vote for anyone at all who would support that system? And I couldn't find them. So I got out, and um, I, I'm actually, I could literally go on for days on secret combinations, take you through scriptures that just lay it all out so clearly, but we need to fix our heads because we think of it so differently. Just remember they're administered to us, and the only way to administer a secret combination is to indoctrinate a kid for 12 years, <laughs> and to do what Korahor did. Right? The, the Book of Mormon is truly an alien book to a non-born-again person, right? As Alma says, you have to be born again, or you can't see it. Korahor is us. Korahor wanted separation of church and state, which we have to this day. 
Nehor wanted popular election of representatives, which we have to this day. Nehor wanted uh, politicians or priestcraft practitioners to be paid from public coffers, which is what we do. Nehor wanted the separation of church and state, which is what we do in Utah. So uh, Korahor wanted it so that you couldn't teach the Ten Commandments as a criminal law which is why it was so hard for the Nephites to prosecute him. They didn't know what to do with him because he claimed religious conscience. And so they didn't know how to prosecute him for things like adultery, because that's what he was perpetuating. But he would say, hey, I, you know, I know you have a law against adultery, but I don't believe in your God. So you can't punish me for just doing what I think is right. And they were like, what do we do with this guy? You know, I, They didn't know how to treat him, so they just kicked him out of places. So when you study what the secret combination is, you also have to understand that it is ancient. It goes back before our world. It mm -hmm. always has been. Mm -hmm. And it is very, very appealing. Okay, that's the first thing you got to understand. It's, it's not people in black robes eating babies. <clears throat> it's everyday Latter-day Saints who, like it says in the Book of Mormon, the righteous came down to believe in their works and gave control of their entire government like we did in Utah, right? Spencer Cox is your governor. I don't care how much you love him. He helped launder $100 billion with a secret combination, and we don't care. So I can't really blame him. He's just a participant. He's a, he's a Latter-day Saint participant in a political system where he looks at it and goes, well, Better me than somebody else. And why not? We're okay with that, right? I mean, we wouldn't really elect <laughs> me. I'd get up and be like, Jesus lives, repent. And people are like, yeah, get rid of that guy. You know, he's, he's out of here. And I'd be like, elimination of public schools. And people would be like, ah, yeah, we can't have that guy. Some of us would be happy. Yeah, <laughs> not very many. I um, I'd, be I'd be crucified by the women of Utah for that. <laughs> okay, so, so you go back um, in a secret combination. You say, okay, well, where do these things come from? And we go all the way back to Cain, of course. That's the easy one. But then there's this guy named Pharaoh. Who's Pharaoh? According to the Pearl of Great Price, Pharaoh was a good man. And, Pharaoh, and God liked Pharaoh, but Pharaoh couldn't have the priesthood for some reason. And so Pharaoh, in all sincerity and faith, tried to imitate the order of God by creating a government. And like George Washington did. Because George Washington was the founder of modern Egypt, the original Pharaoh. And, and what happens is once Pharaoh establishes the country, Egypt, it's generally a good place. And so what happens is George Washington in about um, in the early 1700s after the establishment of the nation, he writes a letter to a friend, which you can find to this day in the Library of Congress, where he says, hey, the Jacobins and the Illuminati are trying to infiltrate the Masonic lodges. And you're like, did he, did he just really write that? <laughs> like, that's a conspiracy theory. And then you explore what he's saying, and it goes back to France, where you have the Jacobins and the Illuminati killing Marie Antoinette. And guess what doctrine they were using? We don't want an American constitutional republic. We want a communal, communistic republic, a democracy. So George Washington says, hey, these guys are here. The Jacobins and the Illuminati are here. And what does Washington warn us about earlier in his farewell address? Stay away from factions. Don't create, please do not create a bipartisan system of factions. And by Andrew Jackson, guess what we do? That's what we do. The rise of the very first party, the Democrat Party, and all of the presidents will come from a particular place in civil society that George Washington was worried about by Andrew Jackson. He's the first Masonic Democrat president. And who infiltrated the lodges? The Jacobins and the Illuminati. And succeeded in fraction, uh, factionalizing America. Now, I, I don't assign any ill will to any Masons or anything. I simply point that out because it's an interesting parable for ancient Egypt. Because where did Masonry arise? 
in ancient Egypt. And who helped restore the engineering and secrets of ancient Egypt's ability to build temples? A guy named Hiram from Tyre, and his buddy was Solomon. And the Masons claim uh, kind of political ancestry all the way back to that guy, Hiram Abiff. And Hiram Abiff was killed, according to Masonry, by a secret assassin in the temple of God built that he helped build. Yeah, that's interesting, right? What an interesting parallel. Joseph Smith will say, later, I have done that which Hiram Abiff could not. Also really interesting. So what we see is we see that Egypt, America, gets taken over by a infiltrated society that is a secret combination, not masonry, I mean the Jacobins and the Illuminati who take over masonry and use it to obtain power in America. Guess what every influential president, almost every president in the United States from there to Lincoln will be a Masonic Democrat. And guess what Joseph Smith will yell as he jumps from the window in Carthage? Is there no help for the widow's son? The widow, Hiram Abiff, because he's being killed by a political group of assassins who belong to a group called the Masons, and he's ushering the Mason distress call because they're obligated by their covenant to come to his aid, and they don't. They kill him. Now, again, that's not the Masons. There's an infiltration by Jacobins and the Illuminati. Guess what philosophy the Jacobins and the Illuminati embrace? Socialism and communism. Okay, so here it comes into America. It's the inception of socialism and communism. You've got to go back and study Jacobinism and, and the Illuminati. So the Masonic Democrats will control Egypt. And Joseph Smith will gather Israel to where? Modern Egypt. And where does Joseph gather to? The East Coast. Because Utah, what's considered the West in Joseph's day? Missouri. Missouri. Okay, so Egypt is the east coast to Missouri. And after the Civil War, guess who loses power? Egypt. Egypt and the, Mas the Masonic Democrats lose power. In fact, you get these candidates who literally campaign in the Whig Party against the Masons because all these presidents are Masons. And they're like, hey, there's something wrong here. Civil War, and then you've got the rise of these other orders called like the Skull and Bones, the Independent Order of the Odd Fellows. Again, no, no offense to the Independent Order of the Odd Fellows. Um, you have infiltration issues, okay? But the Skull and Bones, they're just evil. They're super evil. And all these groups in the 1920s create an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations, <laughs> which every single head of the State Department in America has been since that. And it's where the Democrats and the Republicans come together and laugh at all of us for being stupid enough to be either one, literally, because they're a team and they gather every year and they plan what we are. That's as Eagle, which starts in 1920. I can't go into that. So, so once you look at the, the roots of these secret combinations, right, you start to understand who they are. The manifestation of the secret covenant happens for a purpose. It's not accidental. It's to... Uh, as it says in the Book of Mormon, to um, combine against all righteousness. Okay, so, so now imagine that in about 50 B.C., you've got a problem if you're the secret combination. What is it? Jesus is coming. 50 years out, right? So, there's something really wrong with the Gentiles who are going to kill Jesus. What is it? Who are the Gentiles according to Christ at that time? The Romans. There's a problem with the Romans in 50 BC. They're a republic, not a monarchy. What do you do when you got to overthrow a republic? You raise up, as the Book of Mormon calls them, kingmen, right? You got to raise up kingmen in the secret combination to overthrow liberty. So you overthrow the Roman Republic, and who does it? A guy named Marcus Anthony. <clears throat> Marcus Anthony's a king man. He combines against Rome with two other conspirators. 
and he commissions a special group of soldiers called the Legio Deus Fratensis. You could also have the Legio Deus Equestrius, right? It's the Legio Deus, the Roman 10th Legion. And they are his arm, and they kill. Right? When, when you want to take down the Roman Empire, those are the guys you go to, and then when you're done, what do you always do with your hitmen? You disband them. <laughs> Guess who pops back up throughout the history of the secret combination Rome, like post-Republic Rome? Legio Deus Fratensis pops up every now and again. Guess where they typically get assigned? To the Levant. What's the Levant? Israel. Why are you always sending the bad guys down to Israel? Well, because you've got an obligation under a condemnation to make sure that when Jesus shows up, you can kill him. But you've got a second problem if you're the secret combination, because God smuggled away a group of people to an entirely different continent. So what's your duty? you got to get over there. But nobody knew about the old world, right? Right? So if that's true, if you believe that, because that's what you're taught in school, then explain this to me. We're going to go to the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is commanded to take up a lament for the king of Tyre. Who's the king of Tyre? Hiram Abiff, coincidentally, who's friends with Solomon. And we'll read about what Solomon and Hiram did together, but why is he lamenting the king of Tyre? Because he was once a choice man. He was so choice that he got to walk in a sacred place, which is where? How did Hiram of Tyre walk in Jackson County, Missouri? If, you, if you're LDS and you believe LDS doctrine, Eden's in Jackson County, Missouri. How did Hiram get to Jackson County, Missouri? So God says, Ezekiel, I need you to lament this guy because he walked in Eden. Now, coincidentally, we have another modern king of Tyre, raised in modern Tyre. Tyre is New York. And the rightful king of New York was a guy named Joseph Smith, who also walked in Eden who said, I have done that which Hiram Abiff could not, not only walked in Eden, but restored the fullness of the gospel and built the temple, and then was assassinated very similarly to Hiram Abiff. So the Lord says, man, lament this guy. Well, why? How did he get to Eden? How did Hiram get to Eden? So we go to 1 Kings. First uh, Kings chapter 9. And we go down here where we learn about Solomon, who has a buddy named Hiram, Hiram from Tyre. And the Tyr Tyrians become the Phoenicians, the greatest sailors of the Mediterranean. But what's the problem with being the greatest sailor in the Mediterranean? You don't have a port in the Red Sea that will get you to Ophir. And Solomon wants some stuff for his temple, so he and his buddy Hiram decide to create a navy of ships in Ezion Geber in the Red Sea. Why would you do that? Take a look at this. Ezion Geber in the Red Sea is definitely not the Mediterranean. But boy, if you could sail out of the Red Sea and hook that horn of Africa, what would happen to you? Well, coincidentally, you'd wind up right over here in the Gulf of Mexico, and you could access both the Yucatan, which is rich in gold, and Missouri, and America, which is rich in lumber, and guess what Hiram and Solomon come back with? Lots of gold and lots of lumber from a place that to this day, the biblical scholars don't know where it is, Ophir. Now that's interesting because we know who Ophir is, right? We're Latter-day Saints. We're supposed to know this stuff. Hugh Nibley knew it. Now, Ophir is the son of an important guy. All right. You recognize this line of people right here? Who's that guy right there? What's his other name? Malchizedek. 
which is also the name of Jupiter, Zedek. Here's our Malchai Zedek right there. His son is our Faxod. Notice the uh, first letter. What is it? It's a vowel. Vowel in Hebrew is an aleph, which signifies firstborn or recipient of the birthright. So you just follow that birthright. Okay? Our Faxod to uh, Salah and Eber. Now, who gets the vowel? Eber. Who does Eber become? The Hebrew people. The guy with the birthright. He's the second kid gets the vowel, the eleventh. Okay? Eber gives birth to a guy who is not the firstborn. <coughs> Peleg. How in the world? Peleg is the for forefather of Abraham. If you were to take Peleg and Joktan and put them in two columns, okay, and trace the ancestry of Peleg, guess who you'd wind up with? Abraham. If you followed Peleg, it stops. Dead ends at Ophir. It's almost like Ophir like, left the Tower of Babel, like Pseudophilo says, because his father, Yoktan, smuggled him out of the Tower of Babel, and he took off to a promised land. But Christians don't believe that, right? So Ophir, interestingly, who just disappears off the face of the earth, his Hebraic, because uh, he doesn't have a Hebrew interpretation. There's, you look up what does Ophir mean in Hebrew, and it's not there. So you've got to break down your Hebrew letters, and guess what it means? A guy who leaves all wickedness, is associated with the number eight and attains all righteousness. Can you think of anybody? <laughs> associated with the number of eight who leaves the Tower of Babel and attains all righteousness. The brother of Jared. That's exactly who Hugh Nibley thought this guy was. But Hugh Nibley didn't have some popular beliefs in the church because we still embrace things like Mesoamerican theories of the Book of Mormon. No offense, BYU scholars. <laughs> so, Pele, you know, Joktan then has a kid who's named Ophir. And where did Hiram and uh, Solomon sail to? So, okay, if my dad, right, had been a man like Joktan, and by the way, how do you pronounce Joktan in Hebrew? Yoktan, okay? If, if my dad had helped me like that, I would have named the land after him. So if Solomon and Hiram really are sailing to Eden, and, and they're going to the place of Ophir, I would expect to find a place named Yokton. Yucatan. Yucatan. Now what's interesting about the Yucatan is if you go study the origin of the name Yucatan, it is not a Mayan name. And the Mayans will admit this, and they'll say, we have no idea. The, if you want to know who the, where the name came from, go talk to the Chantal Maya. And the Chantal Maya will say, we're, we're not Mayan. We're the Yucatan people. Well, how did you become the Yucatan people? Well, we came over with the Olmecs. Yes, when the Olmecs came, about 2000 BC. So when Hiram and Solomon sail, it takes a year and a half to get to Ophir. It's about how long it'd take out of the Red Sea to come over to the Yucatan and walk in Eden. And then it's a three-year round trip. So when you're Marcus Anthony and you're trying to bring down the Rome in the name of the secret combination because you know Christ is coming and you've got to kill that guy, but you also know he's going to go over here to this other place. And so somehow you've got to do what Hiram and Solomon did and you've got to get over here. Now, when is, when is Marcus Anthony doing all this? About 50 B.C. When does Gaddy Anton show up in the Book of Mormon? 50 B.C. Comes from out of the land. Knows a secret way how to get out. He's not a citizen. He can't run for office. That's why he uses Kishkumen. Takes over Kishkumen's organization. Now what's crazy is Gad is a Hebrew name. You find it all over the Book of Mormon, but Anton is Greek. How do you get a Gad and an Anton together? Well, it's really simple. <laughs> when the secret combination invades the Levant under Marcus Anthony and subsequent rulers of Rome, you would come down here into Israel, and guess who you would meet first at the northern edge of Israel in the Levant? The land of the tribe of Gad. 
So you marry your daughter off to one of the sons. You send them off in a boat to the other side of the world in the name of the secret combination to combine against all righteousness. And a guy named Gaddy Anton comes into the land who is expert in words and in his craft and introduces a doctrine of murder for power, just like Marcus Anthony. This is all just a conspiracy theory, okay? So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. What's in, what's even, what gets even more interesting is as the um, band of the Legio Deus Fratensis start to be used, it's the Legio Deus Fratensis originally commissioned by Marcus Anthony and the other horrible rulers that bring down Rome that sacks Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy of Christ and kills everybody and raises the place to the ground and burns it. So what if Christ had confronted at some point in time the uh, Legio Deus Fratensis? More than likely, he would confront them in the area of northern uh, Israel or the, the land of Gad. And it just so happens that there's a story in the Bible about Christ being across the Sea of Galilee in a place called Capernaum. It's and he top. noticed this little town down here. Oh, sorry. Where'd it go? Right there. Can anybody see that? Hamat Gader. It's the land of Gad. It was the land of the Gadarenes, the land of Gadara. Christ sails on a boat over here to Gadara. <laughs> and he gets off the boat, and there's this guy living in the crypts who's possessed by a legion of evil spirits. And when Christ asks the spirits their name, they say, we are legion because we are many. And so Christ, who, um, I don't know if you know this, Christ hated pigs. And that's why he allowed the evil spirits to go into the pigs, because he hated bacon and wanted to kill all pigs. And so he's like, yeah, just go to the pigs. I don't like them, which is nonsense, right? Because everybody likes bacon. <laughs> so, so here's these evil spirits. He's like, yeah, just go on over into the pigs. Why would he do that? That's nonsense. This guy's the savior of the world. He wants to prove to the Jews, not only am I your spiritual savior, but if you would believe in me, I could save you from the Romans, but you won't believe in me. So how can I save you temporally if you can't see me spiritually? So here's this spirit. And he's sitting there like, hey, can we go into the pigs? And he's like, yeah, go ahead. But he doesn't call them pigs. What does he call them? Swine. Swine. Okay. Wouldn't it be interesting if this group of secret combination murderers... <clears throat> We're in the area at the time, which they were, in numbers of about one to 2,000 to 10,000 if they had the equestrians with them. And uh, what if their banner was a swine? Oh, my gosh. That would be really coincidental. So how do you get these secret combinations? Well, they start in certain places. Well, here's what's even crazier. When you go study the tribe of Gad... When they get their inheritance in the northern area of Israel, guess what they do? They build an altar next to the altar of God, which causes Joshua and all of Israel to come up and threaten to kill them all. They're like, we're here to kill you. And they're like, it's not because of the altar, is it? Yeah, it's because of the altar. They're like, well, because uh, what did Israel do? What have they done? They made a covenant with God that if we break this, you'll come in and destroy us. And here's Gad already building a false altar right next to the altar of God. And Gad's like, Gad does what Gad does. They lie. It's, it's just our altar to God. And Israel's like, well, we don't really want to kill him, so let's all go home. So they all go home. You never hear of Gad again. You never. Gad just doesn't show up and tell the Book of Mormon. And one more time. Remember when I showed you the presidents of the United States and the kings of Israel? And remember how we walked through and matched them all up? Hey, guess what also lines up exactly? Ezra's eagle prophecy. And right when we get Jehu... Ezra's eagle says we should get this crazy contrary feather who doesn't want to be part of the system. Right at the same time. Now you line those two up. And what happens with those kings 
is these are wrong sorry shoot uh, that's a combination of so there's 19 of them and jehu is the tenth right but according to ezra's eagle a couple are gonna fall off a couple are gonna be killed and then these three big heads are going to take over the three eagle heads this is second ezra 11. and when you when you see these things all line up you line them up with the northern kingdom of israel and there's these guys who basically depose uh, Israel's kind of regular reign of kings. And the guy who starts it off that matches the three heads in Ezra who reign with much oppression, according to Ezra, the first one is Menahem. Okay, so we're at Jehu. Actually, we're at Jehoahaz. And... Don't don't take this literally, okay? I'm, I'm simplifying this because when you merge all these together, you got to drop off some of these guys according to Ezra's eagle, okay? And it mixes up this picture a little bit relative to Jehu's posterity. So I'm, I'm super simplifying it, and I apologize for that. But um, what happens is the they can't quite undo the effects of Jehu. Like Jehu has these lingering effects on all future presidencies or kings, kingships. And so they get to a point with Shalom where they're just like, that's it, we got to overthrow this whole thing. And so the guy that starts that is this guy right here. Guess what house he's from? The house, not of Gad, Gadai. And he's from the same area as Gad. So the overthrow of Israel is caused by the house of Gadai just as the Nephites are brought into destruction by Gadianton so when you think of these secret combinations they are subtle and perpetuated into the fabric of our society such that you can't even recognize them and they go back so far in our cultural heritage that when you go to school and learn of the Romans as a great empire, they don't teach you the real problem with the Roman Empire. And so we adopt these concepts of like Marcus Anthony being kind of this hero of the past in history, when in fact he was a murderer and a kingman and a member of a secret combination who helped lay the foundation for the murder of Christ and the invasion of the Nephite land. But he did it subtly. He was, you study Gadiant in the Book of Mormon, he's a politician. Literally, you read about him, he's a politician. And he came 50 years out from the beginning of their new millennium. Who came 50 years out from the beginning of our new millennium? The McCarthy trials, where a crazy guy in the U.S. Senate said we're having a communist infiltration in America in the 1950s. All right, um, so... That, that's also one of the reasons why those, you know, the series of kings that start with Philip of Macedon, Alexander the Great, what do all these guys have in common? They burnt libraries and cities. Why? To eliminate the history of Israel. This is, don't repeat this. If you're recorded, eliminate this part. I, no, I'm just, you know, turn off. It's just super controversial, and I hate to even say it, but. It's kind of a good example. How many Jews died in World War II? How many Jews lived in Germany? Not six million. 300,000. Yeah. How many Jews lived in all of Europe? Not six. About six million. About six million. Hitler killed every single Jew in Europe. Do you believe that? No. So what's really going on? Who's? What is a Jew according to Nephi? One who comes from the land of Judea. What do all tyrants combine against? They combine against all righteousness. The house of Israel. So when you see a tyrant, who is he really taken out? It's Christians. It's, it's, and, and I know Jews don't consider them Christians. I'm okay with that. But they are the people of the Lord. That's who the secret combination goes after. 
who did the who did the communists eliminate? Hundred million people in China and Europe. Christians. That's the covenant, right? It's to get us. And if here, okay, here, if I were to bring this back to a salient point, why does that matter to you? Because if you don't understand what side you're on, and you don't prepare, they are. And there will come a moment when they take the facade off and kill people. And if you're not ready for that day, you're, you're toast, right? Because they're, they're serious. So when, when the moment comes in the Book of Mormon, when the moment comes in Europe and, not, and the Nazis can finally reveal their plan, it's to take out the people of God with, without, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Indiscriminately. And not only did he kill all the members of the House of Israel all over Europe, he took all their stuff and spoiled them to fund his racist, stupid people who just blindly, including members of the church in Germany, who were like, oh, I'm just doing my job. It's better that they fall than the German economy go down. By the way, you know what gave rise to the German economy? You know who, uh, you know who George Washington defeated in the Battle of Long Island? Prussians. German. Prussians. Prussians. Major, major embarrassment because they were a mercenary economy. And then Napoleon beats them, right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, Napoleon beats them. And it devastates the Prussian economy because they're the most famous mercenaries in the world. So guess what they do? Like, we're not mercenaries anymore. <laughs> we're going to create an industrial society, and the way we're going to do that is create a public school that everybody pays for. I kid you not. And they created the first public schools. <laughs> we modeled our schools after theirs, and theirs gave rise to Nazi Germany, which killed a bunch of Christians and Jews. That's the secret combination. That's how they administer it to your kids. And we, I, give my kids to them. We, anyway, we got to change that. <laughs> we did. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.